This channel is part of the History Hit Network. We've all seen the pictures and read the stories in the history books about the kings and queens with their power and privilege and silks and furs. But in this series, I want to discover the other side of history. I'm already quite nervous. The side we don't often hear about. How ordinary British people lived their lives. From the Tudors, you'll see why it did attract my attention. <laughs> Disgusting. To the Victorians. Throw a stone in Victorian London, you will hit a drunken cabman. There's, there's, there's that many of them. We are not amused. From the Georgians. You take the saw. Oh, my God. It's you horrible don't. just seeing you do that. Oh. To the people who really fought the Second World War. James could hear the ping of bullets and the clatter of shrapnel. One thing's for sure, these people knew the meaning of the word tough. I'll be finding the truth about their daily lives. What they ate, how long would that have lasted? Up to three years. How they made a living. There's even value in a rat when it's dead. And those vital necessities of life. What did you do if you wanted to pee? Go in the bucket. The bucket? This is British history from the bottom up. You've got to admit, I am terrifying. <laughs> This time, I'm going back 500 years to England in the reign of Henry VIII. A time of sex scandals, executions, and cod pieces. Who I see. The history books are full of his antics, but what about the people who really made the country tick? They may not have been well dressed or had any money, but their lives are full of surprises, love, and courage. During Henry's reign, living in towns was going out of fashion. And it's not at all hard to see why. The streets were paved with evil-smelling mud, and inside, floors became layered with spittle, vomit, urine, and bits of fish. But even for the Tudors, there was someone you really didn't want to live next to. A knacker. No giggling, please, because a knacker was a very important person in Tudor society. He was the bloke who went round collecting dead animals, then taking them home, skinning them, chopping them up and making money out of them in whatever way he could. Now, there aren't any specific names of actual Tudor knackers in the records. We're going to call our one Thomas Grimes. Here's Tom skinning a carcass to make saddles. His whole house would have been full of little bits of bleeding animal and it would have permeated such a stink that it would have been foul even by Tudor standards. Nevertheless, he would have had a way of making a steady income. Enough for clothes and food and maybe even a long-suffering wife. This is how Tom's day would go. He'd leave home about 6am, like most Tudor men, pick up his cart, head off out of town towards the local farms. The big money makers for Tom were dead or dying cattle. And horses. Hmm, this one's got potential. Poor old thing. Even in town, there could be opportunities. You'd find dogs, cats, even the occasional horse. Hang on, what have we got down here? Oh, look at this. A rat. There's even value in a rat when it's dead. Back at base, Tom would skin carcasses for leather, boil them to get the fat out for candles, extract gelatin for glue, and grind up the bones to make fertiliser. And after years hacking about with all this flesh, he became pretty good at it and wasn't bothered by the smell and sight of blood. 
And these skills were about to open new horizons for Tom, all thanks to his king. Because Henry was making a lot of enemies. And Tom was just the sort of chap he needed as an executioner. Whenever the paranoid monarch Henry VIII threw all his toys out of his cot and demanded the head of some hapless noble, it could mean a very big payday involving one of these. Although the reality is, wasn't it, John, that most criminals were hung rather than having their heads chopped up. That's true. Hang hanging was for the ordinary people. It was only people of royal or noble blood who were actually decapitated. I mean, decapitation was a whole different business. John White is a historian of crime and punishment, and he studied Tudor executions. So how does Tom, my knacker, come into it? Well, you see, the axe was often a messy business, so in order to perfect the process, you needed to have somebody who, day by day, was proficient in chopping flesh with an axe and wasn't bothered by a bit of blood and gore. I can see that, at least when Tom started to be an executioner, he might feel pretty shaky about doing this job, particularly if it was someone who was high nobility. Well, on the basis that decapitation is for people who are noble and royal, you could be intimi intimidated by the sheer process because there you are in front of an enormous crowd, booing and jeering. They like a good death. Yeah. It could be a great lord uh, and somebody that, you know, literally frightens you and you're now going to have to publicly kill them. Would you get decent money for this job? Well, you get paid more than being a knacker because as an executioner, there are benefits. The clothes that the condemned wore, they would become his, but it was also the custom that the condemned would pay almost like a tip to do me a good job. What would the relationship have been like between Tom and his audience? Well, they would cheer him if he did a good execution. They would boo him if he conducted a poor execution. And would he have been patted on the back in the street? Oh, no, 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 no. You see, as a knacker, he'd be the lowest of the low. As an executioner, he'd be even lower than that. Uh, everybody knows who he was, he'd be jeered, he was a social pariah, so they were almost the underclass, the untouchables. Tom's tale is a really miserable one. Scavenging to earn a living, a rat. Being looked down on, and then the only way of making more money is to become a figure of hate. Despite all this, we know that many executioners were proud of the contribution that they made towards Tudor society, and that by and large, ordinary people believed that the death penalty was the bedrock of their system of justice. During the reign of Henry VIII, one bad harvest could spell ruin, even death. Everyone was constantly famished. So, imagine that you're an ordinary, poor, Tudor person, constantly obsessed by where the next meal is coming from, and suddenly you're given the opportunity of a new life where every day you're faced with a banquet. I'm talking about a career in the culinary profession. Not only was it a proper paid job, but you'd be fed and surrounded by a bounty of delicious food which often needed testing. Yes, but be careful what you wish for, because this tale has a bitter ending. Richard Roos began working in a kitchen in the early 1500s, around the time young Henry VIII was getting to know the ropes as king. Richard was probably too poor to attend school, so at age seven, when a kitchen boy was wanted at his Lord's Manor house, he jumped at it. Before sun-up on his first day, he was sent off by his mum to walk several miles across the fields to his new life. It was a chance that offered Richard career development and, who knows, maybe even the opportunity to meet the rich and famous. You can be my flip -flop, don't you if he was lucky, little Richard got to stay in the big house with the other staff with a proper bed and windows with glass in. But he probably only saw his mum once a week on his day off. <sighs> Mark Meltonville is a Tudor cooking expert. So he's just started here. Mm -hmm. What kind of jobs would he have been doing? 
Well, if he is a boy of the kitchen, then it's right down the bottom to start with. There's not going to be a lot of sweeping that and go and get me some wood, chopping wood. So he's going to do a lot of really menial stuff. Pot washing, not very nice, I'm afraid, cleaning all those cauldrons. How do you clean them? Because they didn't have squeegee soap bottles. No, no, days, no squeegee, they? but they have plenty of soap. It's, oh, very, it's very easy to make. It was made commercially. Uh, and even if you want to just make some yourself in the kitchen, you take uh, a pan full of fats and bacon fat and put a little bit of ash in it. Richard would have been expected to use the soap to wash his hands before the day's work began. To clean his teeth, he'd have used candle soot, chalk or salt. What so, kind of hours would he have been working? Probably starting quite early in the morning. So they're going to be down here between five and six, getting everything ready, because the meal of the day is going to be sent over to the house by half past 10, 11. But there's only two cooked meals a day. The last one's out by 3.30. So after that, it's clear up, set it all down, and once he gets a bit older, a pot of beer. That's <laughs> oh, really quite pleasant, isn't it? The dish of the day, I'm, on a dig right in. I'm beginning to warm to the idea of being a Tudor cook. And we haven't even got to the food yet. He's going to be working with so much more um, fresh meat than anybody outside in a farm's getting. It's going to be fresh meat almost every day, so it's just going to wow him. Perhaps it was access to all that rich food, but Richard grew a little curvy and must have made a name for himself because he was soon headhunted to be cook for the Bishop of Rochester. This should have been a major opportunity for Richard, but the country was in the middle of a major political crisis and Richard soon found himself in hot water, quite literally. In 1527, Henry VIII asked the Pope if he could divorce his Queen Catherine. She was knocking on a bit, hadn't given him a son, and besides, Henry had met someone new. Gorgeous Anne Boleyn, who, as Henry noted, had a nice pair of pretty duckies. But some people in England failed to support Henry, including, yes, the Bishop of Rochester. The bishop's opposition to Henry's divorce was about to have a devastating impact on his cook. It all started on February the 18th, 1531, when the bishop held a banquet. And he wasn't feeling great that evening, so he didn't eat anything, but his guests scoffed away, and by morning, 17 of them were ill, and two had died. <laughs> Immediately, rumours abounded. Everybody thought it was poison, and the finger was pointed at the cook that night, who was Richard Roos. They said that he had deliberately attempted to murder the bishop on the instructions of a vengeful Anne Boleyn. More likely, it was just a bad case of food poisoning. But Henry was hopping mad that the name of his sweet Anne had been dragged through the mud. So he sent Richard to the tower to be tortured, until, guess what, he confessed to it all being his fault. It sounds like things were pretty grim for Richard, but they were about to get a whole lot grimmer. Henry passed a law, especially for Richard, permitting a new form of execution. Death by boiling. But it wouldn't be a simple matter of 12 minutes in the pan and you're done. No, it's recorded that Richard was locked in a chain and pulled up and down with a gibbet at diverse times till he was dead. And that took two long hours. Documents from the time record how Henry VIII joked to his courtiers, I've cooked the cook. <laughs> It was a world away from what kitchen boy Richard had imagined all those years ago, when all he had to worry about was the washing out. So a top tip for survival in Henry's England would be, don't ruffle the king's ruff. Which you'd think would be easy, given that most people lived in the countryside in simple houses with thatched roofs and walls made of sticks and dung, minding their own business. This is what life was like for the vast majority of people in Tudor England, a world away from the sex scandals and skullduggery and fabulous costumes that you saw in the court of King Henry VIII. 
Take, for example, a Yorkshire farmer, Richard Jenkinson, and his wife, whose name isn't recorded, so let's call her Anne. This might be the couple out in the field at harvest time. Richard must be as worn out as his trousers. Like 90% of the Tudors, Richard's family spent most of their time in the great outdoors, teasing a living from the soil. And it was long, long hours. They could start from as early as five o'clock in the morning and not finish till they lost the light, which in the summer months might be 10 o'clock. In contrast to their king, who pigged out on banquets every day, there were just two simple meals. Something to munch in the fields, perhaps bread and cheese, and at the end of the day, one hot meal to look forward to. This is the kind of thing that Anne would have prepared for their tea. This is pottage made out of turnips and beans, thickened with a few breadcrumbs, and maybe just a sprinkle of local herbs. On special occasions, they might even eat a chicken. At night, totally exhausted from the labours of the day, Richard and Anne would fall asleep on their crude mattress made of straw with the kids just a few yards from them. With five or six, it would be a squeeze. Give up. It's over. And if they had any precious animals like a prize pig, that could sleep in the room too. <laughs> You couldn't afford to let it slope off, and pigs are notoriously difficult to house train, so as you can imagine, the room would have stunk like crazy. But more important, if you spent a lot of time in the proximity of farm animals, you ran the risk of contracting killer diseases. It's no wonder that the average life expectancy was just 35 years. There was no NHS, and Tudor medicine was rubbish. Problem with gout? Apply worms, pig's marrow and herbs boiled with a red-haired dog. Bit deaf? Stick a hare's gallbladder and some fox grease in your ear. <laughs> with a fire in the middle of the room and no chimney, the place would have been full of smoke, so the children might well have had respiratory infections. But people and animals would be snug together, and hopefully the thatch wouldn't catch fire. If they were lucky, the next day would be a Sunday and their only day off. But there was no let up for Anne, because she'd also have to make everybody's clothes. Starting with a bit of fleece straight off a sheep's back. Marion Knights, a Tudor technology expert, knows Anne's secret. How do we get it from that into some kind of yarn that we can make something out of? Well, that's where this comes in. Ah, the spindle. This is the drop spindle. How does it work? Well, basically, you just spin it. So this twiddles round. And I can feel when there's enough twist, because it nips my finger up here. Then you can start pulling, it out pulling this out a bit more. It is it's very, very slow, isn't it? very labour intensive and slow, yes. How often would people have been um, doing this? Every time she'd got an empty pair of hands, she would have got the spindle out, you know, waiting for the pot to boil, waiting for the baby to wake up, standing at the well, waiting her turn. This was the only way she could clothe her family. Anne would also have done her own weaving. So what sort of outfit would she have made for her husband, Richard? I'm meeting clothing expert Nina Michaela. The thing that sticks out for me more than anything else is how robust all this is. I would have thought that he would have been in rags. Well, no, I don't suppose he'd last very long in the fields in rags. It is sure. very robust. He's got a warm woolen layer on the top, and in fact, the whole thing is lined in another oh. layer of, of wool. Yeah, you'd be all right in the fields yeah. in this. So and what's all this under here? Well, yeah, that's a bit startling, isn't it? He's got red. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Wasn't expecting that. <laughs> There was a very strong belief in this period that red was a colour that kept you healthy and it was a good colour to wear near to your skin. And then you've got this shirt underneath that. Yeah, so everyone, man, woman and child, always has a linen layer next to their skin and, and that's the bit you can wash, which none of these you, you could be washed in water. Big question. Vest and pants? No pants, I'm afraid. Most men used their shirt, which was long and split at the sides, so you could tuck the front this way and the back that way, and that was basically your pants. You'd be nice and warm. Yeah. What about um, the women? Well, women, absolutely no pants. Long skirts, don't need them. All the time that we've been talking, there's been one item of 
clothing that's been catching my eye here. <laughs> Excuse me about this, you'll see why it did attract my attention. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> you? Are you sure? <laughs> I didn't realise that ordinary people had cod pieces. Yeah, by this day it was just completely standard wear on men's hose. So that they were taking in the fashion of the richer people and incorporating it into their own clothes. Exactly. I mean, it does seem like a weird fashion, but in the 15th century the cod piece didn't exist. Yeah. It starts as just a simple flat flap that's used to cover the fly. Yeah. And then human, maybe male nature comes in and it becomes a bit more exaggerated and a bit more padded and embellished until it is, by this state, just standard. Almost like the one the king's wearing. But King Henry's influence on Richard and Anne was about to extend even beyond cod pieces. It was the summer of 1513, just four years into the reign of young King Henry. One morning, Richard got up as usual, went down to the river to fetch a bucket of water, probably had a quick pee in the hedge on the way, when suddenly he was stopped by one of his landowner's servants who gave him a message, or more likely an order. The lives of Richard and his family were about to be turned upside down by the activities of his firebrand king, Henry VIII. Richard was being called up for military service. During the reign of Henry VIII, an Englishman could be called up at any time to serve his king in battle. And in 1513, that's exactly what happened to Richard Jenkins. The young Henry VIII looked like this. And he dreamt of being a great warrior king and ruling both Scotland and France. So, aged 22, he took his toughest troops and invaded France. James IV of Scotland couldn't believe his luck. With Henry gone, England could be his. So it fell to Henry's queen, Catherine, to recruit an army for him. 25,000 soldiers, including Richard. Poor farmers like him had to provide their own weapons. Luckily, Richard had just the thing. Because in Tudor times, there were sheep everywhere. Hello. Bear with me here. You see, in order to stop them wandering all over the fields and eating the turnips, these things began to appear throughout the Tudor landscape, hedgerows. And to trim those, you needed one of these things, a bill hook, which was a simple slashing, scything tool, which you just made the hedges tidy with. With a few modifications, Richard's hedge trimmer was fashioned into a lethal weapon. His local blacksmith simply tweaked the bill hook design with a series of nasty twists and turns. Now Richard was ready to take on the Scots. To find out how, I'm visiting the Royal Armouries in Leeds and meeting curator Andy Dean. Richard wouldn't have been able to escape from going to, into the army, would he? No, I mean, it's part of that feudal system. So they knew that if the call came, there was no getting out of it. And possibly your wives and your children would come along with you. Oh, as really? Why would they do that? Well, it's part of the baggage train. And women had a vital role before the battle and after the battle. I mean, obviously picking up the bits. But, of course, you're more likely to fight if you feel comfortable. You have your loved ones around you. And, of course, you don't sort of just go somewhere, fight and come home again. You might be away for 40 days. And so having family around you, then maybe there's a greater reason for the ordinary man to fight harder. Yeah. To get to the battle, Richard, Anne and the kids had to walk about 150 miles sleeping in the fields each night. They couldn't carry much food, so the army often looted from villages along the way. Of course, going to war would have been terrible, but it would have been a bit of an adventure too. Remember, Richard had probably only ever been about 10 miles from his home before, and suddenly off he goes, and he can bring his wife and kids, it would have been like some sort of weird summer holiday, except he might have got killed. 
Richard would have to summon up the courage to confront one of these guys. So noisy and heavy. I'd have wet myself. What am I going to do against this guy? I don't think this is going to be much use. No, he's almost impervious, but if you came across this guy, actually, you and your mates have got the perfect weapon. You can see where the gaps are. Where would you thrust this spike? Bang. Exactly. So it's gone through his eye socket into his brain. Now, yeah. it's called a bullet hook for a reason. What would you do with the hook here? Uh, no idea. All right, well, I would wrap this around the back of his neck, haul him to the ground. Richard would need nerves of steel. But he did also have some protection. This would be the most basic, a uh, jack of plates. Uh, the plates inside the uh, linen garment could be made out of horn. This or is really heavy, plates. actually. Well, it needs to be heavy, but not so heavy it limits you. And it's protecting, obviously, your engine, heart, lungs. So your engine is protected, but your computer's not. So we need something for the top end of you as well. All right, let's and have again, a computer cover. Yeah. And there would be an armory, and there would be. 50, 100 of these, and you'd be get one of these, and you'd pad it to make it your own. On it goes. There you've got goes. your bill hook, you've got your jack of plates, Here and we go. now, with 20 other blokes all lined up who are motivated, you've suddenly become a very important part of the army. You've got to admit, I am terrifying. <laughs> when they finally arrived to fight the Battle of Flodden, the English army faced stiff odds, attacking uphill against greater numbers and the Scots had bigger cannons. If the Scots won and captured a chunk of England, it could have been the end of Henry VIII. Richard watched in awe as he waited for his turn. On one side, you'd got the Scots with their long pikes, which were brilliant against knights in armour on horseback, but weren't nearly as good when it came to close fighting and they were up against Richard and the other Tudor farmer soldiers, armed with equipment better suited to hand-to-hand -hand combat. Bill hooks, which were stabbing and scything weapons. Richard and his comrades began to push the Scots back. Finally, in one last desperate move, the Scottish king charged down right into the heart of the English ranks, but the infantry held firm. They pulled him off his horse and slaughtered him. King James IV of Scotland killed by common farmers with billhooks. The English army had won a famous victory and Richard could now return home. With his adapted hedge trimmer, our simple farmer had helped save Henry VIII from a humiliating defeat, one that could have ended his entire reign. Phew. And with all that blood, sweat and toil, the Tudors needed to let their hair down. And fun for our Tudor ancestors was pretty much the same as it is today for us. Festivals. Is this the way to Glastonbury? Football. Or Beardson. And most important of all, a glass of ale down the pub. And if you lived in Leatherhead, Surrey, this could have been your local. 500 years ago, presiding over everything from the brewing of the beer through to the ladling it out to the guests was a woman, Eleanor Rumming. Can I have a pint, please? This is Eleanor, still welcoming customers to the pub. And the running horse is a modern twist on the pub's original name, Rumming's House. Eleanor's life was tough. She'd be up at dawn seven days a week, fetching water from the river and cleaning up from the night before. She had a kitchen over here somewhere, set away from the pub, and in here she would have made bread and cooked all the meals for the family, and round here you would have had pigs and chickens, and there would have been lots of herbs growing so that she could produce the meat and the medicine for her family. But the most important part of her workplace was here. This would have been where she did the brewing. Eleanor's ale was old school even then. After the barley was malted, 
She'd have added her own signature mix of herbs like thyme, rosemary, nettle, yarrow and mugwort. It would have been a murky brown brew and tasted sour and smoky. And it would go off pretty quickly because Eleanor didn't use hops, which are important for preserving beer. She produced about 10 gallons a week for her family and all the rest was put on sale because in those days everybody drank ale, even children. Partly because it was thought to be more nutritious than water, certainly didn't give you the jip like water did and it made you feel good. We know all about Eleanor from a bloke who stopped off at the pub one night for a drink. And he happened to be Henry VIII's poet laureate, a bloke by the name of John Skelton. And he wrote this poem about Eleanor. From our point of view, it's brilliant because it describes an ordinary person in great detail. You may think he wrote it because he was besotted by her beauty, but in fact, what he says was, her face all boozy, comely crinkled, wonderfully wrinkled, <laughs> like a roast pig's ear, bristling with hair. It's <laughs> charming, isn't it? Skelton goes on insulting Eleanor for about 600 lines. But it wasn't just her looks that he was slagging off. This was full-scale character assassination. According to Skelton, she was a sexual deviant, she was a dodgy businesswoman, she cut her ale with all sorts of disgusting stuff. Look at this. And sometimes she blends the dung of her hens. I can't imagine Skelton came back for a second pint, can you? So what's the truth about Eleanor? Jager Wise, 2018 Brewer of the Year, has studied the ancient craft of ale making all the way back to Tudor times. Why does the poem slag her off so much? It's implied quite heavily that she's doing things like watering down the ale or cheating customers. Um, Do you think she really did cheat the customers? Yeah, she was fined two pennies for, um, for serving false measures. And she was lucky that she was fined. One of the other punishments would have been a thorough ducking in the local pond. Like a witch? Yeah, like and a witch. That's one of the things that strikes me about the poem. She does come across as a bit witchy, doesn't she? There is said to be a relationship between uh, witches and alewives. It's true that alewives would have used a big cauldron, may well have had a cat for pest control, and they did put a broom outside the pub to show the beer was ready. But why would anyone want to demonise women like Eleanor? What begins to happen is the brewing industry begins to become professional. And when that happens, the alewives are a considerable threat. So, what do you do when you're under threat? You spread rumours about them, you spread lies about them. You want to make their product sell less than your product. What about Mr Rumming? We yeah. don't hear much about him. I imagine him as some drunken old sot sitting in the corner while his wife coins it all in. Yes, and there is a reason why alewives are called alewives and not ale women. It's because most of them were probably married. Mm. And Eleanor would have had a certain amount of financial freedom, but it all belonged to their husbands. So, Eleanor did all that hard work, didn't directly receive any financial reward, and risked a ducking in the local pond. I wish I could have been standing here 500 years ago watching the real Eleanor presiding over her little boozy kingdom. But as for this poem, I feel split down the middle about it. Because on one hand, it's funny, it's bawdy, it brings to life a working woman in the Tudor period. But on the other hand, it takes the mick out of her. It slags her off. And that kind of writing about working women at that time helped drive a nail in the coffin of their lives. And it meant that they were cut off from their work and all the opportunities that go with it for centuries to come. Over the course of his reign, Henry VIII managed to annoy the Pope, the French, 
the Scots, and it seems most people in Europe. How did it happen? They'd had quite enough of Henry. It's just another oops on me. And now, the threat of invasion hung in the air. The new situation demanded that England have a ready and well-equipped navy, which meant that suddenly a lot of ordinary people had exciting new job possibilities and the chance of long-haul travel. 7,000 new seamen were taken on as Henry expanded the Royal Navy from five to 40 warships. So what kind of life could a novice sailor expect in the swashbuckling early days of the Navy? Well, for once, we can answer that question in incredible detail, thanks to a remarkable Tudor time capsule that emerged from the drink nearly 40 years ago. There is the wreck of the Mary Rose. It has come to the surface. In 1982... It's a wonderful structure and a wonderful sight. Salvagers recovered Henry's flagship Mary Rose, which had sunk back in 1545. The Mary Rose is safe and well. On board were 19,000 artefacts and the jumbled bones of 179 sailors. And in one corner of a lower deck, archaeologists found one complete skeleton. An ordinary seaman we'll call John, a man who went down with his ship. So this is our man, this is John. This is John. Alex Hildred is a curator at the Mary Rose Trust and first dived the wreck back in 1979. He doesn't seem hugely tall. He isn't, actually. He's about our height, more or less. About five foot four-ish, maybe five foot five. It's... Well, I'm five, four and a half, so... Yeah. Perfect, you Almost see? identical. Almost identical. What about age? Uh, age, you can see that the sutures have all closed, so he's probably between 20 and 30, a perfect age for somebody who's a hard-working individual. John, who would have looked something like this, was one of a crew of over 400. I can't wait to see his home, the ship where his body was found. Are you ready? Yeah. You know I've never seen this before. No, really? <laughs> Truly. Come on, open the door. Go on, have a look. Oh. Oh, wow. I've so always wanted to see this. To me, this is like the tomb of Tutankhamun. Half the ship rotted away, but the remaining half's in good nick. It's as though the Mary Rose was cut down the middle lengthways to give us a sneaky look inside John's home. Where was he actually found? He was found just over there. So this is the hold of the ship. And there were four people in there and five big barrels, well, barrels about this high with tar or pitch in them. So it looks as though he was working? It looks as though he was working. John had about the most important job on the ship, to stop it sinking by keeping it waterproof, what's known as caulking. At sea, his mission was to constantly check that the timbers were watertight and to repair them with tar and pitch before the ship sank. Every day, he would have worked a relentless shift pattern of four hours on, four hours off, signalled by the tolling of the ship's bell. John may have been a local lad who learned his craft from about 14 years of age as an apprentice at Portsmouth Dockyard. Then around 18, he'd have had his big chance of a life of adventure at sea. Imagine his first day. He must have been completely awestruck. Have you got any idea where John might have slept? Likely he would have just slept anywhere that he could have done. Maybe on the storage deck above or on the main deck by the guns. That's the sort of thing we hear, of people just crunching themselves up beside the guns and falling asleep as much as they can. I bet everybody would assume that he would have slept in a hammock. Hammocks weren't around yet, so no, no hammocks. And for an ordinary seaman like John, there were certainly no cabins or bunks either. All right, we've got him up in the morning. What about his ablutions? 
Well, the only evidence we have for that are two channels, if you like, both up on the upper deck in the stern, yeah. which basically they were like urinals, and they, they went out through the side of the ship with little protruding, basically, beams, which had a hole in the center, so everything would go out the side. Have we got any evidence of the kinds of things that he might have done in order to make his spare time bearable? Actually, really close to where he was found, just on the deck above, we have evidence of two gaming boards. Musical instruments, in fact, we had a fiddle that was found just by uh, the main mast. So we've got a fiddle and a tabor drum and pipes. I love the idea that you've got a ship's band. You look at something like this and all you see in your mind's eye is the serious nature of running a ship, but they were grooving away as well. Also near John Skeleton, they found one of these. I know what that is, that reminds me of primary school. Yeah, those are one of our most common objects, both the anti-knit combs part, which are very, very fine, and then the one for normal grooming. He would have had knits, wouldn't he? Probably. Yeah. And you do hear of people throwing themselves in the sea to get rid of the nits. But John might have got comfort from a special friend. A small skeleton was found in the doorway where John would have picked up his tools. Interestingly, in the opening of it, because it was a sliding door, so almost jammed in the crack, was a, was a small dog. I know, we called him Hatch because he was, wasn't too far away from, from the hatches. But, yeah, but he yeah. was so far away that he couldn't get out. He couldn't get out, no, I know. And he actually is our most complete skeleton. I don't want to get too weepy about this, but John would have seen him every day, wouldn't he? He would have, and he was only 18 months old, the dog. Just a, just a baby, really. Let's move on before yeah. I Quite. show myself up. <laughs> This may be one of the great archaeological treasures of the world, but it's also the place where young John lived and worked every day, along with 500 of his mates in very dark, cramped conditions. Imagine, though, how proud he must have felt about being a crew member of the Mary Rose. But in July 1545, the French attacked the English fleet at Portsmouth. Henry watched as the Mary Rose went out to engage the enemy. All the cannons to starboard fired a volley together, but as she turned, her gun ports fatally dipped beneath the waterline and water rushed in. John's whole world would literally have been turned upside down. There would have been things flying across the room, up, down, backwards, forwards, smacking him in the face, then a final gush of freezing cold water, and then that was it. No escape. The Mary Rose sank like a stone. Only 30 of over 400 crew members escaped. John perished where he worked. I like to think that John would be pleased to know that the English Navy finally managed to repulse the French, and also that he might be a bit tickled if he knew that 500 years after he died, his life would become immortalised. The Mary Rose had been Henry's pride and joy for 34 years. Its end, foreshadowed his own. He died two years later. And thanks to his reign, the lives of ordinary people would never be the same again. This time, I'm going back over 200 years to Georgian Britain. Nowadays, it's seen as a period of great sophistication and elegance. Darling, where did you get that dress? May I have the next dance? But for ordinary people, it was far from that. For them, the Georgian period was particularly cruel and nasty. In everything from laws to living standards, there was a huge chasm between the poor and the wealthy. But... Some of those who came from the wrong side of the track weren't prepared to accept their dreary lot. Jack Rann, who was born in 1750, was one of them. 
Here's Jack. Right there. Like many ordinary families at the time, Jack's was dirt poor. They would most likely have lived all together in just one room with no running water and just a bucket for a loo. We think his dad was a peddler, a street seller earning maybe six or seven shillings a week. Just 35 quid in today's money. Which meant that most of the family's money was spent on bread. Certainly not on fun. And yet, just to rub it all in, Jack lived in a city that was oozing with luxury and pleasure. Bath. The go-to tourist destination for Britain's rich and privileged. They came here to party, sample the spa waters and generally ponce around. Oh, the heartache! <laughs> But at least the Toffs provided a business opportunity for a certain canny young someone. Yep, no school for him. Instead, he'd be following in the footsteps of his dad. Twelve-year-old Jack regularly used to pitch his peddler's cart in the city centre, in the square, selling Georgian delicacies like pastries and oranges. His customers were the high society men and women strutting around like peacocks with their hair piled high on their head. <laughs> like a glossy magazine centre spread there, right in front of him. And the more he saw of it, the more he wanted a piece of the action. And quite frankly, he wanted to look cool enough to get some of the girls. Jack saw his chance in the Georgian lust for high-speed travel. For Jack, the growing numbers of wealthy travellers whizzing around the country in fancy carriages meant the chance of Jack going places too. When he was just 18, he got the plum job in this new world of high-speed travel. He became a coachman. And was soon running all the transport for a large household. Chris Thompson is an expert on the sort of life Jack would have had. That coat that you're wearing, that to me is a traditional coachman's clobber, am I right? Yeah, a great coat, has many capes for keeping out the weather and is very heavy and warm. So in inclement weather, it would be something of a saviour. In warm weather, it wasn't too good. And Jack would have wore something like this. Yeah. <laughs> what hours would he have worked? Long hours, long into the night. If his employer requested to travel overnight, then Jack had to be at the ready. On a daily basis, he would probably work from dawn till dusk. And Jack wasn't exactly raking it in. He'd get just 10 to 15 pounds a year, a couple of grand today. Although he did get meals and accommodation thrown in. <laughs> Regular public stagecoaches were uncomfortable and packed tight with smelly passengers but Jack's was in a different class. It's beautifully padded. It's like your sofa at home and you're just sitting there watching the telly. When Jack reached one of the new coaching inns to overnight, his passengers went inside to relax with a hot meal and a freshly made up bed. But Jack's long day wasn't over until he'd washed, brushed and fed the horses. Often, his own bed was right beside them, along with any fleas and ticks that might happen to be crawling around. One thing was for certain. Being a coachman was not giving Jack the glamour that he craved. What he wanted was the fat cat lifestyle of his wealthy passengers. He'd seen them hand over wads of cash every time they stopped to pay for the fancy wine and the gorgeous meals while he had to bed down in the stable. <laughs> it was time for a career move. Jack was about to become a highwayman. Yeah. Stand and deliver! Even back then, highwaymen were romantic figures more daring and glamorous than bog-standard robbers. 
the mid-Georgian period was the heyday of the highwaymen. There were loads and loads of travellers around, there was no organised police force to catch them, and like most highwaymen, and indeed highway women, Jack would ride up to the coach with the travellers in it, he would shout your money or your life, and he would wave his pistol. Yeah. But it was extremely dangerous. Passengers could carry guns too. So Jack knew the risks, but he was determined that even if his career was going to be really short, at least it would be fun and exciting and just great. So he dressed like a dandy. He had these silk breeches, and each one was tied with eight silver strings at the knee, so he got the nickname Sixteen String Jack, which is a pretty good nickname, isn't it? And there was one victim who remarked, Jack behaved exceeding civil and rather begged for the money than used any violent means. He was so cool. Yeah, we run the roads. Yeah, we run the roads. As Jack notched up success after success, his pile of cash and his charisma rapidly grew. But the authorities were on to him. He was caught and tried, not once, but an incredible 17 times. And on each occasion, silver-tongued Jack outwitted the judge and charmed the jury. But finally, in 1774, Jack was accused of stealing from the king's daughter's chaplain. What's wonderful is that you can hear Jack's brass cheek and his accent in the court transcript. He says, I knows no more of it than a child does unborn. They have said false things to you. But Jack had made a fateful error. The court didn't take kindly to the princess's pastor being called a liar. He was found guilty, and this being the Georgian era, he was sentenced to death. But in true Jack style, he enjoyed a saucy last supper with the governor of Newgate Prison and seven delightful young ladies. The next day, a showman to the end, he danced a high jig on the scaffold before the noose tightened around his neck. In Georgian times, Britain began to rule the waves and ordinary men went off to sea, exploring, trading and generally enjoying themselves far too much in ports across the globe. That's me wages gone. Hello, big boy. Another drink, anyone? One such man was a 24-year-old Irish sailor called John Mara. He was minding his own business one day in 1770, just hanging out in a lively port on the Asian island of Java, having a drink down by the harbour, checking out the girls. Oi, you! Grab him! Come here! When suddenly, John was surrounded by British Marines. Are you employed? They were looking for crewmen. Who are you working? And had the right to force any seaman between 18 and 55 to join their ship, Pushing whether he wanted to or not. Right, get over there. John had no choice. He'd been press ganged. <laughs> About a quarter of the Navy's sailors were recruited like this. So who exactly was behind John's dastardly kidnap? None other than the famous explorer, Captain James Cook. John was now a sailor in Cook's crew on board HMS Endeavour. John Mara soon calmed down. He admitted that one ship was pretty much as good as any other and that only a fool would want to stay in this disease-ridden port. So he was welcomed on board. Mama told me to live. In Georgian times, there was no such thing as cabins for ordinary seamen. So, when John first got on board, he would have been given a hammock, he'd have gone below and found somewhere to put it, and that would have been his living quarters for the rest of the voyage. But at least he travelled light, so storage of all his worldly goods wouldn't be a problem. These were called ditty bags. This was where each sailor kept his spare change of clothes, his mementos, his knife, 
his Bible. That was the lot. And John wouldn't even have had a uniform to worry about because he wasn't an officer. Strap your things tight across your back, honey. So this is where the men lived, and down here was the officers' quarters. And if any of the sailors just went beyond that line, they could be shot by a marine. If you just looked an officer in the eye, then you could be punished for dumb insolence. But look at the difference. This was how the officers lived. John became a gunner's mate. His job was to keep the cannons secure and the powder dry. He also made sure all the ship's ropes, pulleys and sails were in good order. He'd work four hours on, eight off, with extra time off when they reached port. Most days, John would be faced with just endless skies and endless seas. But it wasn't exactly peaceful. <laughs> it's hard to imagine, but this deck would have been covered in goats, sheep and chicken, even cows. And some of the men had clubbed together and brought a pig on board. And all those animals would have created a right old mess. one that John and the other seamen would have to clean up. Everyone knows that sailors used to scrub the decks, and I'd always assume that that meant with a scrubbing brush, but it didn't. This is what they used. This is it's like a square of sandstone, and you stuck a peg in it like that, and you went back and forward and back and forward, day after day. Essentially, it was a discipline thing. It just kept the lads from arguing and thumping each other. But it had a secondary effect, which they weren't at all aware of, is that it kept the germs down. So, essentially, ships were a pretty healthy place to live. Though, after a few months at sea, there'd be less mess to clean up because all the animals would have been eaten. Sophie Forgan, an expert on Georgian naval cuisine, knows what kind of food John would have been left with. That's a bit of really manky salt pork. Now, salt that pork. is as solid as a rock. Yes. How long would that have lasted? Well, the did last up to three years, oh. but pretty awful by that time. It must have been incredibly salty. Very, very salty. But one way you got rid of the salt was to put the joints in a small net and tow them behind the ship to wash some of the excess salt off. Is it right that occasionally John would be treated to something weird like albatross? It is right, everything they shot was eaten. The only one they turned their backs on was walrus. <coughs> the sailors said, no way. But there was one fate even worse than walrus for breakfast. Scurvy. On long voyages, it was the biggest threat to John's life. The disease was caused by a lack of vitamin C, and on some ships, it killed half the crew. Men like John were terrified of scurvy, and you can't blame them. It was absolutely horrible. Your skin started to go pale, your eyes sunk in, your gums went all swollen and bloody, your teeth fell out, you got covered in bruises, then your arms and legs started to go black. Death, when it came, was a blessed relief. Luckily, John never got scurvy, and travelling at a modest speed of just under 10 miles an hour made it as far away as it's possible to be from Britain, the South Pacific. He must have thought he was in paradise. In Tahiti, he got friendly with the local chief, who apparently offered him his own house, his own land, and the prettiest girl in the village to be his wife, chosen from among a dozen maidens. John was over the moon. What an offer! Let's get out of here! And being a strong swimmer, he knew when to make his move. He waited till the sails were being lifted and the anchor was being weighed, and sprinted to the side, dived overboard, and began swimming through the crystal clear waters towards paradise. 
Unfortunately, he was spotted, he was dragged back and brought dripping into the ship to be punished by the captain. This is what he would have got, the cat and nine tails. Wham! But uh, he wouldn't have been standing up. He would have to lie down like this. And this was known as kissing the gunner's daughter and get whacked on the back and on the bottom. Dozen lashes, that was the standard dose. Although, quite honestly, for a bloke like Mara, I don't think it would have made any difference. After five years sailing round the world with Cook, John finally returned to Britain. He'd made a bit of money, and he could have called it quits, settled down in Ireland in a cottage by the sea. But he didn't. Grog got the better of him, and he drank it all away. And the last time we ever hear of him is in a port on the coast of Australia, looking for another berth, another ship, and another adventure. One thing you definitely didn't want to be in Georgian times was ill. You might find yourself being bled for acne, or get tobacco smoke blown up your bottom to cure a headache. And as for surgery, even if you could afford it, run a mile if you're able to. If you were poor, naturally, you'd be stuffed either way, unless you happen to be in the right place at the right time, which surprisingly could be somewhere round here. It's just another day in London's most notorious district, Jacob's Island near London Bridge also known as the capital of cholera or the Venice of slums. Houses rotted by dampness, windows covered in paper and rags, the whole place overcrowded with people and dirty-faced kids swarming everywhere. One of the residents, 60-year-old Elizabeth Regan, is woken up really early by the racket of people clattering past. When she's emptied the contents of her chamber pot out of the window, she pops out and joins the queue for the pump to get some water for her stew. In Georgian times, 60 was considered pretty ancient, so Elizabeth was probably shacked up with her grown-up children, helping out with the cooking and the shopping. Nearby Borough Market was the perfect place for her to bag a bargain. This particular morning, she was rushing down Borough High Street, avoiding all the crowds of people and all the horse-drawn carts. And as she's crossing the road, she trips over, a cart runs over her leg, multiple compound fractures. And remember, in those days, there were no ambulances, no NHS. But she's very lucky, because the accident has happened just outside one of the most important hospitals in London that's been here since medieval times, St Thomas's. There must have been a friendly bystander who helped her limp to the door. Then Elizabeth would have been carried up these stairs. 52 ancient, cranky wooden steps. You really do feel like you're walking back into history. Next, bleeding, in pain and on the edge of consciousness, Elizabeth wouldn't have been certain that the hospital would even admit her. Julie Mathias knows all about the history of St Thomas's. If I came here, I've had a road accident, my legs are all smashed up, my mates carry me here, dump me on the floor, what would be your response? Well, you would actually be quite fortunate in that case because the hospital provided one ward um, to access cases of an emergency such as yours. Casualty? So I've actually come to Absolutely. Priority casualty. patients, yeah. as you were. Yes, indeed. So, things are sort of looking up. Despite being from the worst postcode in London, Elizabeth had a world-leading surgeon on her case. 
I'm going to put myself in her place to get an idea of what Elizabeth went through in Europe's oldest operating theatre. Karen Howell is my surgeon. Scary. Karen, presumably you're going to operate on me because you've got the pinafore on. That's right. I'm the um, operator for today, the surgeon is for you, so I'm hoping to amputate your leg. Elizabeth must have been a tough cookie, but this experience would have terrified her. I must admit, I'm already quite nervous, just below me here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Look at this. This sawdust, presumably, is for collecting my blood and bits and pieces. You it? got that right. That's actually for uh, to stop the blood going through the floorboards. The, uh, the church is below us. There was a church under the other. I, I don't yeah. want to drip on the congregation. Do That's I? right, yeah. But fear not, Elizabeth. You're getting high-tech treatment. The operating table was the latest design, featuring a pop-out platform for Elizabeth's good leg, even a headrest, and the table was a handy height for holding her down. Thoughtful touch. Tourniquet is on to limit the damage. We're managing your blood, so that when we cut, I don't lose much blood. But that wasn't all Elizabeth had to cope with. She suffered this indignity in front of crowds of people who were making an incredible amount of noise, yelling at the assistants to keep their heads out of the way. There would be a few medical students, naturally, but in some hospitals, they actually issued tickets. There was no anaesthetic, just a piece of leather to chew on and maybe a prayer before the chop came. In the 18th century, Georgian method is circular action on one knee. Are you ready? Yeah. We have permission to amputate and um, you're bracing yourself. There's an old technique they call the uh, tour de maître. Uh, master's round, goes round like this, and you can see what's going to happen. So we're ready, and it's what we say, and pull out like Whoa, this. Wow, so that's just splitting me right open all the way around. Um, and the idea was um, then you take the saw. Oh, my God. We know really it's about six to eight cuts. Through that one bone, very fast saws they are. It's you horrible know, just seeing you do that. Yeah, but then that um, is the bone through. So my leg's gone now? Yeah, there's no leg there now. Yeah. Elizabeth began to faint, but got a hefty slap to keep her conscious. With blood everywhere, she must hang on in there. The arteries are now severed, and we need to act quickly to uh, close up the wound. Basically, we put a thread through there, like this big, thick thread, and tie it like a drawstring bag. The operation was a success. Well, at least Elizabeth didn't die on the operating table. But then came the tricky bit, recovery. Thanks to the unsanitary conditions in the hospital, Elizabeth's chance of survival was just one in three. Despite her ordeal in the operating theatre, Elizabeth didn't make it. She never left the ward. Within a week, she died of infection. And yet, within 50 years, the medical profession had started to become aware of bacteria and began cleaning their surgical instruments and their operating theatres. Although, sadly, for one brave Georgian, that came too late. One of the biggest problems for the poor in Georgian times was that they were powerless to change their lot. Ordinary people couldn't vote, so the laws were made by the rich and for the rich. And we'll hang. And to keep the working class under control, the powerful voted in a long list of crimes you could be hanged for. Over 200 of them, in fact. You could be strung up for anything from, oh, destroying a toll gate to impersonating a Chelsea pensioner. How dare you? But even more serious was pinching the Toffs game. Local rumour down here in Hampshire at the time suggested that Charles Smith was a practitioner of the dark art of poaching, although no one had ever actually seen him do it. This looks like Charles in 1821, age 28, with his son. Standing at six foot tall when the average was just five foot five, he was thought a rather romantic figure. 
He even married above his station. Charles lived with his wife, who was the daughter of a wealthy farmer, and his kids and his little terrier in a cottage very much like this one. So he got a roof over his head, probably thatch like this one. This is actually quite gorgeous, isn't it? But to feed his family, Charles needed money. Some of it came from his day job as a casual labourer. He could get the occasional day digging ditches, lugging clay around at the brick kilns, scraping the skins at the tanners. And back in the old days, that might have been enough to buy things like butter, cheese and the occasional bit of meat for dinner. But getting food on the table was getting harder and harder. A run of terrible harvests, new food laws and fat landowners jacking up their prices changed everything. Now, to avoid starvation, families like Charles's had to spend all their money just to buy the basics. This is how the food would have been cooked, although it would have been pretty rudimentary. Something like tatters and shake, which was potatoes with salt on it, or a flatbread, like something that you get in the kebab shop, the difference being that there was no meat in it. In fact, they had virtually no protein at all. <laughs> I want some protein. And in 1816, the government made it illegal for ordinary people to hunt and kill any sort of game. Even wild rabbits. Oh, courgettes and butter. So while the rich had more fine food than they could fill their faces with, turbot, turbot, turbot. Charles and his family were starving. Mm, <laughs> Charles's local landowner was an aristocrat called Henry Temple Viscount Lord Palmerston, which is a bit of a mouthful, and he was the future Prime Minister. He loved having fancy parties for his hunting friends, and his estates were jam-packed full of deer and pheasant and partridge and all sorts of yummy treats. So if a man's kids were hungry, what else was he supposed to do? <coughs> Charles turned to poaching. Seb Littlewood is an expert on poaching in Georgian times. What kind of snares or traps did Charles use? There were small traps, like these small animal traps. So... What is that? It looks like a trap for fairies. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's about the, about the right size. <laughs> so this is, this is how this operates. So it's sprung by pushing this down. You open the teeth, um, and then we clip that up like that. OK, so it's all set for the rabbit. Along comes Mr Rabbit. Yeah. La, 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 <laughs> yeah. Oh, God, that's so horrible, isn't it? It's not nice. And presumably, the thing about leaving a few of these around is that it means the gamekeeper will know that there are poachers about. If the gamekeeper comes across them, he knows people out and about. Poacher comes back to check his traps. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah, yeah. So a rabbit trap could become a trap for the poacher who set it. So if Charles wanted something much bigger and much more effective, what might you do? Well, there is this option. I suppose something like this. Hey. <laughs> would you actually be able to bring down something like a rabbit with that? You would, although it's a musket. It works much the same way as a, as a, as a modern shotgun. Oh, so you put pellets in it? Pellets in it. This was a scatter shot, meant that hopefully anything sort of 10, 15 yards away, you're going to hit it. But isn't there a big drawback to using a gun? The bang? The bang, the size, absolutely. Yeah. Generally, the whole idea about poaching is, is you're relying on stealth, uh, on a level of secrecy. Something like this, you're going to hear it from half a mile away. But Charles was presented with an irresistible opportunity. On the 22nd of November, 1820, there was a big and noisy local festival. Oh, rebel, 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 I do love a rebel. <laughs> None of the revellers, Charles figured, would hear his musket in the distant woods. Hooray! When it was dark, 
Charles went over to his hiding place, produced his musket, and he would have had a big tunic on with a pocket in it down here somewhere, and he would put the butt in it to support it. And then he would sneak out, hoping that before morning he would have been able to find something warm and furry with which he could feed his family the next day. The weather was perfect, just enough moon to light the way and just enough wind in the trees to mask the sound of footfall. Taking his terrier, Charles made his way to collect his brother-in-law, John Pointer. Then the two of them pressed on to the plantation of Palmerston's estate with all its rich pickings. Cautiously, they crept to the spot where they'd seen pheasants roosting earlier. Charles raised his gun, but unfortunately, deputy gamekeeper Robert Snellgrove was a party pooper who'd rather be lying in wait for poachers than reveling. As soon as he heard Smith's gun, he was after them. Snellgrove caught up with them, and as he did so, there was a bang and an almighty cloud of smoke. It cleared to reveal Snellgrove bleeding badly from his thigh. The poachers were nowhere to be seen. Charles Smith went on the run, but Snellgrove had seen his face clearly enough to identify him. It took them over a year to catch up with Charles, but eventually he was tried in Winchester, and on March the 23rd, 1822, he was hanged. <laughs> Charles was one of the last men hung for poaching under the Georgians. He was unlucky. Just a year later, the law was changed and poaching was no longer punishable by death. In Georgian times, the countryside was beginning to get crowded. So a lot of ordinary country folk started heading off to the cities and nowhere was a more seductive destination than the booming capital. In the 1730s, the whole of London was squashed into a fraction of its size today. London started here, round about Tower Bridge, that's there, and stretched about a mile in this direction over towards Westminster, and that was London, and it was ram-packed full, about 700,000 people and dogs and horses and other animals. And amongst this hurly-burly was a woman called Elizabeth Bowman. She's in there somewhere. That's her. Elizabeth was one of the many young single women who saw an opportunity to make money from Georgian London's expanding population. Six days a week, she'd get up at sunrise and leave her small rented room to come shopping here at Covent Garden Market. It was the best place in London to buy juniper berries, herbs and spices, because Elizabeth was a maker and seller of the capital's most popular recreational product, gin. In Georgian times, in London, they were knocking back an incredible seven million gallons of gin every year. That's it's stupid. Two pints of gin every week for every adult. Oh, thank you. Two pints is what we drink on average per year. I mean, all right, I'm slightly more than the average, but you know what I mean. Anyway, Elizabeth certainly had a lot of eager customers for her product, but what was her life like? Anastasia Miller is an expert on drinking in the 18th century. Why do you reckon a woman like Elizabeth would have got involved in the gin-making trade? Because if you were a good girl, <laughs> you would want to do something where it, it's honourable enough that you could sell something, you could make something, you could make enough of a profit. So are you implying that she could avoid the sex trade. She could avoid the sex trade. An incredible 20% of Georgian London's young women were involved in the sex trade, whereas selling and making gin was considered far more respectable. For Elizabeth, it meant she could afford a new bonnet when she needed, or visit one of the new theatres 
that was springing up around Covent Garden. And she might even treat herself to a ball of scented soap for her daily ablutions. Making gin was a bit of a dodgy business. First, Elizabeth probably blagged a jug or two of rough, neat spirit from the local distillery. No questions asked. OK, so Elizabeth's got some of this dodgy yes. stuff. She takes it home. Yes. What does she do? Well, she's going to make it into gin. <laughs> Easiest way is you take your spirit. And she probably used, you know, just regular old crockery jugs, things like yeah. that. Now, here's the important part. She had to have juniper. Is that the thing that really marks gin out? That is what gin is. But juniper berries were pricey and might sometimes have been beyond Elizabeth's budget. Other way to do it, to get that piney smell, was to use this. Piney? <laughs> I know what that is. <laughs> is, that, is that paint stripper? Well, that's oil of turps. Turps? Yeah. They used to tick turps into the gin. Well, they also used to take oil of vitriol to give it a little bit of peppery bite. Which is what? No, Sulfuric is. acid. Oh, that's ridiculous. Oh, I know. And if she was feeling creative, Elizabeth may have added her own herbs and spices as well. Seal this up. Let it sit overnight and you're done. You've made gin. Once Elizabeth had made her gin, the next challenge was to flog her dodgy home brew. One of the most horrible things confronting Elizabeth daily would have been the sheer filthiness of London. There'd have been rubbish strewn all over the place, pigs snorting everywhere. And in the days before main sewers had been put in, human effluent was just chucked into the street or else whoosh went straight into the River Thames. Elizabeth would have had to walk many miles a day through this without wellies or a face mask just to get to her customers. Where and when was gin sold? They sold it everywhere. <laughs> they went up and down the streets to do it, but the best place to sell gin was if you showed up to places where people gathered. And you're looking at hangings at the Tyburn Tree. If you're going to go see a proper set of hangings for the day, you're going to need refreshment. You're going to need gin. After spending the day at the gallows, Elizabeth might have found some more thirsty customers at the local fight night. Women used to do bare-knuckle fighting because it's another way to make money, and they'd be selling gin as a refreshment, but they also gave it away as a prize. Really? <laughs> ladies love gin. <laughs> but unfortunately, ladies loved it too much, as did men and quite a few children. By the 1730s, Gin was no longer just a recreational drug. Londoners had become hopelessly addicted to the tipple Elizabeth was selling. So the government banned hawking gin on the streets, and that meant Elizabeth's livelihood was seriously under threat. Desperate for an income, she moved her gin operation underground and found a clever way to advertise her bootleg, a puss and mew. What you do, you fancy a gin, right? And you stand, this is absolutely true. You would stand outside it going, puss, 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 puss. Inside, Elizabeth would hear it and she would reply, mew, 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 mew. So the bloke knew that it was time to put his penny in or his tuppence if he wanted a double. And then she would pour the gin out and it would come down that spout and uh, he would get out his pewter mug and drink it. It was a bit like ordering a burger from a drive-in. But in spring 1738, Elizabeth's luck finally ran out. She was snitched on for selling gin and sentenced to two months' imprisonment at the Tothill House of Correction. Georgian houses of correction were pretty brutal places. Inmates like Elizabeth were forced into hard labour. They used to have to spend the whole day hammering away at tough hemp plants to extract the fibres for rope making. They lived in squalid, cramped conditions. The food was meagre. The whippings were frequent. All for committing the crime, basically, of being a poor person trying to get a living in a rich man's world. After prison, Elizabeth disappears from the historical records. Maybe she stopped selling gin. Or maybe this canny operator became even better at hiding her trade. 
For ordinary people in Georgian Britain, whether gin hawkers, sailors or poachers, life was a hell of a struggle. But I'm just in awe of their spirit of survival. This time, I'm heading back to the Victorian age, when Britain ruled the world. And mutton chops weren't just something you ate, they were also lovely whiskers. Why, thank you. Now, while you might be thinking the Victorian Britain was made by a bunch of mustachioed men like him, the truth was very different. Because the unsung heroes who really put the great into Great Britain were just the ordinary folk who had to cope with the most dramatic changes the world has ever seen. While Queen Victoria was busy gazing down from her throne, her loyal subjects were hard at work in factories up and down the land, churning out everything from steam engines to natty clothes and cutlery. But life on the factory floor was cheap. A combination of lethal machinery and long hours meant that gruesome accidents, even death, were never very far away. And right up there in the list of most lethal jobs in Victorian Britain was the match girl. Like Sarah Chapman here, still called a girl when this picture was taken when she was almost 30. In the late 1800s, if you went down the Mile End Road, turned left at a pub called The Swan and down a little alleyway, you'd come to Sarah Chapman's house. She lived in a court just like this one, in a house with her father Samuel, her mother Sarah Ann and her six brothers and sisters. One of seven kids, Sarah was a feisty young un with a sharp brain. We know that at school she learned how to read and write. But this, remember, was Victorian Britain, where at the age of 13, working-class kids like Sarah had to put aside such fripperies as education and get themselves a job. And for Sarah, that meant starting work in the same factory as her mum and sister. This is where Sarah worked, the Bryant and May Match Factory. Back in those days, it would have been frenetic around here, with over a thousand women and girls working here six days a week, every week. You see, there was nothing the Victorians loved more than setting fire to things. Lamps, logs, more lamps, and, of course, tobacco. Which meant that the humble match was an invaluable item. This is an old Bryant and May matchbox. And the thing about this match was that it would strike anywhere, as you can see. Yeah, very effective. So effective that by 1860, Bryant and May were churning out 75,000 boxes of the things every day. To keep up with demand, Match girls like Sarah were expected to work 14-hour shifts, virtually all of it on their feet. Can you imagine? Luckily, she was promoted, and by 19, Sarah was working as a machinist, the person who cut the matchsticks down to size. If Sarah ever got sick, that was just tough luck. The factory was perfectly entitled to discard her like a, well, like a spent match. <laughs> For all that, she earned a meagre wage of five shillings a week, which is about 16 pounds a week in today's money. But even that could be severely reduced by harsh fines on things like sitting down, being untidy, dropping a match, or even just going to the toilet without permission. Nor was there much let up when Sarah finally got home. Sam Johnson is Sarah's great great granddaughter, and she's here to tell me a bit more about her home life. There were seven children in the family. Which is why there's so many beds here. Exactly, yes, yes, and they would have all been cramped into, into a tiny room like this. So maybe that's what created her feisty personality. I bet she was the boss in the bedroom when she was a kid. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. Chuck the boys on the floor and uh, get a good get sleep. Bed, yeah. <laughs> As for her one day off, well, 
After a quick breakfast of bread and dripping, it would be out with the broom and on with the housework. <laughs> the girls, as soon as they were old enough, would have pulled their weight with the housework. So they would do all the washing of the clothes and the cleaning the house and getting the baking done ready for the week. Only then would Sarah finally have been able to put her feet up with a nice cup of tea and perhaps a puff on a pipe. The next morning... <laughs> and it would be up with the lark for the start of another shift at the factory. But Sarah's life wasn't just exhausting. It was also blooming dangerous. <laughs> you see, unlike today's safety matches, matchsticks back then were dipped in a chemical called white phosphorus. It was this that made the matches catch fire. But phosphorus comes with some horrible side effects. And there was one that Sarah dreaded above all others. Girls who'd worked here for some time could get a condition which they called fuzzy jaw. It was a terrible disease that caused the bones around the mouth to slowly rot away and emit a foul-smelling pus. As the infection spread, it would lead to horrendous disfigurement, organ failure and eventually death. Luckily, Sarah escaped this grisly fate, but many of her co-workers, around one in ten of them, didn't. Not that the factory owners seemed to care. <laughs> Even Sarah's lunch hour was full of danger. The women and girls were forced to eat their lunch on the factory floor where phosphorus particles could easily get into their food. There was no other space available and they weren't allowed to eat outside. Health and safety. <laughs> so bad were conditions in the Bryant and May factory that on the 6th of July, 1888, Sarah and her fellow workers downed matchsticks and went on strike. By the end of July, Bryant and May had caved in. The whole thing had been a complete PR disaster for them and they agreed all the women's demands. You can imagine Sarah and her friends racing out of here absolutely over the moon. On the back of the hard graft of ordinary Victorians, the UK became the richest and most powerful nation on earth. With all that money rolling in, the Victorians did what great empires have always done. They built things. Huge engineering projects like railways, bridges and tunnels. Many of them still in use today. Building these monster projects was the job of the navvies. Big strapping blokes like Angus Innes from Glasgow. Now, we don't exactly know what Angus looked like, but we can take a guess. Because Scottish navvies like nothing more than dressing up in their spare time, just like teddy boys, mods and peaky blinders, to let people know who they were. They sported moleskin jackets, scarlet waistcoats and bright blue caps. This is the kind of place where Angus would have lived. He would have rented a room or part of a room or even part of a bed in a boarding house. It would all have been pretty grim. Most of Angus's time, though, was spent building things, like Glasgow's new sewage system. You see, Victorian Glasgow was dirtier than a badger's bottom. Its slums were so bad they were almost as disgusting as London's. Coming home at night from the pub, Angus would have constantly had to watch his step for fear of treading in something unmentionable. In this kind of environment, disease was rife. A system of tunnels was needed to get all the sewage out of the city. And it was navvies like Angus who were called on to do the work. After a typical navvy's breakfast of six slices of bacon, a loaf of bread, one can of condensed milk and two pints of beer, <laughs> Angus's 12-hour shift would begin the moment his foreman gave the order. 
His job was to dig the huge trenches that held the new sewage pipes. Using muscle power alone, Angus was expected to shift a hernia-inducing 20 tonnes of earth a day. <sighs> the more muck he moved, the more he was paid. Oh. On average, that was about 25 pence a day, the equivalent of about eight quid. But most of that he would have spent on beer. A mind-boggling gallon a day of the stuff. Oh, cheers. This massive sewage pipe is an impressive example of the kind of work that navvies were doing here in Glasgow in the 19th century. But to get a more vivid picture of Angus's life, I'm going to travel 30 miles north of here into the Highlands. From census records, we know that by the late 1850s, Angus had up sticks and moved here to the bonny banks of Loch Katrine where he was helping to build a tunnel to carry clean drinking water into Glasgow. This is the water tunnel, which ran for 30 miles straight into the centre of Glasgow. The census also tells us that Angus was now married and that his wife Helen and their young family were living here too, no doubt enjoying the peaceful countryside, along with hundreds of other navvies and a bunch of angry locals. Midges. By now, Angus was moving up in the world and had swapped his shovel for a much more important job. Using explosives to blast a tunnel through the mountains. Which was, of course, very, very dangerous. In fact, the accident and death rate for navvies was higher than for any other group of workers in the country, and that included coal miners and soldiers. No wonder Angus liked a tipple. At the end of the day, exhausted from blowing up the Scottish countryside, Angus would have rejoined Helen and the kids at the temporary camp beside the loch. Here to tell me more about life inside the camp is local historian Sean Barrington. It was a well-organised community. There'd be the cooking squad, so there'd be no problem getting beef and lamb and pigs and oatmeal porridge. There'd be porridge morning, noon and night. That's astonishing. I, I would have assumed that a navvy working here would have been three-quarters starved and having the most miserable time possible. But actually what you're describing is something that, yeah, it's rigorous, Yes. but uh, at least your belly's full. Were the women able to work? Oh, the women would be fully, fully employed. There would be laundry that would need to be done. So, lots of meat by day, booze by night, and clean pants. And, absolutely. <laughs> After four years of muck, sweat and beer, Angus's time at Loch Katrine finally came to an end. And in 1859, the new water channel he'd helped to build was opened by none other than Queen Victoria. I name this pipeline the Katrine Aqueduct. Navvies like Angus were a special breed. They were itinerant, rootless, often very isolated. It was like you had the working class there and somewhere down here were the navvies at the very bottom of the pecking order. And yet it was people like Angus and his like who built modern Britain with their bare hands and their legacy is still with us today. The Industrial Revolution really took off under the Victorians. But none of their fancy steam engines, cotton mills or water pumps would have been any use without coal. Coal powered the Victorian age and the mining industry was huge. In 1841, nearly 220,000 people worked in the mines. Most of them were men, but around about 5,000 of them were either women or children as young as five. Among these women was one Betty Harris. We don't have any actual photos of her, but she might have looked a bit like this young lass holding what seems to be a giant tambourine. 
Betty and her husband lived in a small rented cottage not far from Knowles Pit in Bolton. A place much like this. It was all very cosy. Fire was going all the time, of course. Well, fuel was everywhere, wasn't it? And here's a clue. Tiny little seat, tiny little potty. They had two children, and when they were at work, Betty's cousin looked after them. In order to keep Betty's household going, her cousin did all the housework. She cleaned the house, she went shopping every day, because fridges hadn't been invented yet. She cleaned the courtyard, she did all the washing. Imagine how difficult it would have been keeping things clean with all that smoke and dust about. I don't envy her. But if running a Victorian household wasn't exactly a barrel of laughs, Working down the mine was just horrendous. Six days a week, dressed in trousers and jacket, our Betty would leave the house at dawn and head down pit, where she could spend the next 14 hours on her hands and knees like a beast of burden hauling coal. It's hard to imagine anything more grim. To learn more about Betty's life underground, I've come to Cap House Colliery near Wakefield. If you'd like to follow me, please, through all these doors. Yep. I've been joined by Denise Bates, whose great-great-great-great-grandmother was a Victorian mining lass like Betty. Can you imagine just schlepping up and down here every single day? I think we sometimes don't realise we're bored. <laughs> no, we don't do it. Just like Betty, we're going to have to crawl on our hands and knees to get to the coal face. Whoa! Oh, God! It <laughs> really hurts your hands. Like most of the women and children who worked in the mines, Betty's job was to drag the big, heavy carts used to carry the coal. So this is the conditions that Betty would have been working in, right? Oh, definitely. She reported that she was working in a very nasty pit. Oh! I can't imagine what it must have been like if these were your working conditions for how many hours a day, do you reckon? 14 hours, depending on demand. Blimey. And would you get up to the surface at lunchtime? Not a chance. <laughs> More likely to have been a hunk of bread and cheese on the go. Is this the cold face here? Yeah, it looks like it, doesn't Yay. it? Yeah. yeah. Oh, God, yeah. I should have touched that. <laughs> So, uh, tell me about Betty. She was working for her husband, which was the practice of females who mined in Lancashire. What do you think their relationship would have been like? Betty mentions that there's an awful lot of domestic violence going on, that there were very many women who were being beaten by the man that they worked for, for no other reason than their inability to move those trucks as fast as the men wanted. What with the heat, the dust and the regular beatings, Life for Betty was about as tough as it gets. When Betty got home from work, usually around 6.30 or 7 in the evening, she would have been absolutely exhausted. She'd have been filthy, sweating, but she would have been far too tired to have a wash before she went to bed. One thing she'd definitely have done, though, is have a decent meal. She'd have needed the calories. Apart from rent, virtually all her money went on food. Victorian delicacies such as tripe, trotters, or budget lamb cuts from sheep that had dropped down dead from disease. Come Sunday, her one and only day off, Betty was then expected to catch up on chores like darning socks and knitting stockings, while hubby put his feet up and contemplated the serious issues of the world. <laughs> But Betty's life was about to change. In 1838, a flood at a Yorkshire colliery drowned 26 children, prompting a report after a lengthy public inquiry. So the report was published, and as you can imagine, the press were all over it. Here's some of the daily newspapers that came out in May 1842. Some great pictures. Here, look, you've got propelling the loaded wagons, 
digging out the coal. Imagine seeing these for the first time if you didn't know that that kind of thing went on in your country. But the revelations didn't end there. In fact, it wasn't the long hours, the dust, the awful conditions, the industrial accidents that shocked people. It was, believe it or not, the nudity. The girls, they are naked down to the waist. Young females dressed like boys in trousers crawling on all fours. Any sight more disgustingly indecent or revolting can scarcely be imagined than these girls at work. No brothel can beat it. Disgusting. In actual fact, if it hadn't at all, such topless working was extremely rare. But still, the report had a dramatic effect. And in 1842, the Mines and Collieries Act put a stop to women, including our Betty, working underground. In Victorian Britain, the place to be was in the city. London might have been filthy and plagued by crime, but by the 1850s, it was the world's largest city. And in just 40 years, its population doubled in size, just like Queen Victoria's waistline. We are not amused. And all those new people meant lots of work for London's cabbies. Keb, sir. Keb. Men like John Cochrane. John was born in 1833 and lived in Hoburn, an old-fashioned part of London full of narrow alleyways and densely packed housing. But he was looking to move up in the world. The year is 1851, and 18-year-old John Cockrum wants to set up in business. He wants to do exactly what his dad did before him and be the driver of a horse and cab. Hello, Daniel. You are looking so beautiful, aren't you? But sadly, his dad isn't around anymore to show him the ropes. Because when John was 11, his old man had passed away. Leaving behind a wife, four kids and a huge pile of debt. To make ends meet, the young John had been forced to become the main breadwinner. And by 18, he scrimped and saved enough money to buy himself a horse, hire a cab, and follow in his dearly departed dad's footsteps. But the problem for John was that he looked really young. And on one of his first journeys, he was accused of being a buck, which was the slang word for an unlicensed driver. But he wasn't. He was perfectly legal. He was over 16, and he knew the highways and byways of London, which were the two stipulations. Right, let's go. Come on. <laughs> Back in the 1850s, London streets would have been filled with horse-drawn cabs just like this, leaving great piles of steaming dung in their wake. But while the middle-class passengers were able to put their feet up and enjoy the view, for working-class lads like young John, the job was relentless, six days a week. On an average day, he'd start touting for work about 9am and finish at midnight. He didn't have a little yellow for hire sire on the top of the cab. If he wanted to show people that he was available, he held up his whip like this. Where to, love? Sitting on top of his cab, with only a hat and a couple of old coats for protection, John was exposed to the very worst of London's weather. Chucking all that Victorian soot and smog and the lifestyle of cabbies like John was about as healthy as smoking 40 a day. <laughs> the money wasn't much better either. To make a profit, he had to work really hard. You only got sixpence a mile for a cab like this, and out of that, you had to pay yard money for the stabling and feeding of the horse. It's a tough old job. And it was about to get a whole lot tougher. You see, horses can be very temperamental. As poor old John discovered one afternoon, shortly after buying his very own cab, when his horse suddenly bolted, causing his new set of wheels to flip over. Leaving John 
with a hefty repair bill. <sighs> in fact, accidents like this were pretty common, and more often than not, they were caused by the same thing. Cab drivers were notorious for spending hour after hour in the pub. But did they really? I'll ask a cabbie. Taxi driver Sean Farrell writes a blog on the history of London's cabbies. So, by law, they should have been sitting on the box of the cab, no matter what the weather. Yeah. In truth, they hid inside a pub. Presumably, there must have been examples of cab drivers coming out of the pub hammered and having accidents. Oh, they're, they're numerous. It... <laughs> Throw a stone in Victorian London, you will hit a drunken cabman. It's, 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 it's that, there's that many of them. <laughs> But not John Cockrum. Because John, one of the few cabbies who refused to work on a Sunday, didn't approve of the demon drink. So while his fellow cabbies were off getting plastered, John could be found sitting on the taxi rank, reading a book, and munching on a popular Victorian dish, sorted herring. And before long, he'd signed up to an extraordinary new idea a scheme to stop cabbies from drinking and driving. I oh, know, mad. I'm not really allowed in here, am I? I'm not a cabbie. You're not, but I'll let you, I might give you my badge. <laughs> in 1875, John attended the opening of London's very first cab shelter, a place where cabbies could wait for customers without drinking their body weight in beer. It's great in here, isn't it? Lovely. It's nice and compact and bijou. Yeah. It's a funny shape, though, isn't it? It's really long and thin. They're designed to be the same width and length as the original horse and cow coach, so they didn't take up no more extra space in the road. Oh, so, so just go cab, 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 little hut, cab, cab. Exactly. Do you think it would have been very similar in Victorian times? Oh, absolutely. Uh, they've got electric lighting there. It would have been gas lighting in them days, but they've got, they got a gas stove. They would cook, provide hot meals for you, hot tea, coffee. You could even bring a steak and they would cook it for you and charge you accordingly. And while he was getting his protein hit, John could also browse through a selection of complimentary books and newspapers, keeping his brain fit and alert to deal with London's roads and grow his business. By the time the cab shelters were built in the 1870s, John's business was thriving. He ended up, cheers love, with nearly 30 people working for him and 126 horses. In fact, when he was 68, he sold up and retired on the profits. Not bad for a cabbie, eh? Cheers, mate. Cheers. Victorian Britain was brimming with inventions, and people experimenting with new ideas. But forget your isambard kingdom Brunels of this world and all those boats and bridges of his, and consider instead another great Victorian advance. It's the invention of modern shopping. You see, with all that new industry, wages were on the up. And for the first time, working people had a bit of money to spend. The canny Victorian shopkeeper was only too pleased to help. By the late 19th century, the competition for customers was really hotting up. A hundred years previously, a window display like this one would have been completely unimaginable. The shops had been small, specialist, and staffed by very fierce shopkeepers. But change was on its way, and it was pioneered by women like Esther Brown. Here she is. Esther was born in 1878 in Manchester, where she grew up in a small terraced house. Her dad, Joseph, worked on the trams, while her mum, Margaret, stayed at home looking after Esther and her brother and sister. The Victorians, though, didn't really do childhood, and by the age of 14, Esther had left school and was working on a market stall selling household bits and bobs. But down the market, things were a bit, well, down market. And when Esther was offered a job in a fancy new shop, she jumped at the chance. Esther came up this very road on the first day of her first proper job. The year was 1894 and she was 16. 
This is Cheetham Hill. It's not the most salubrious part of Manchester, is it? There would have been trams clanging backwards and forwards, lots of new immigrant communities. It would have been noisy, vibrant, energetic, and it was Esther's big day. Her new job was as a shop girl at Michael Marx's Penny Bazaar, which was the very first Marx and Spencer's store. This is the Cheatham Hill M&S now. Well, it was absolutely nothing like that. This was virtually a Victorian pound shop. He kept the stock under tarpaulin in the backyard, and over the front door there was a big scarlet sign that said, don't ask the price, it's a penny. Marx's Penny Bazaar wasn't just a bargain hunter's paradise, though. Oh, that is so lovely. You see, for years, if a customer so much as stepped into a shop, they were expected to buy something. But all that was about to change, with a little help from Esther. Esther's job was to try to persuade her customers to do something entirely new. In fact, it was so new, they had to invent a word for it, and that word was browsing, looking at the goods without feeling that you had a compunction to buy them. Nowadays, we're all brilliant at browsing, aren't we? But back then, it was a novelty. Oh, look, a rolling pin, I can handle it. A basket, I can touch it. Of course, the downside was that from now on, shoplifting became a big problem. I'm sorry, it must have just fallen in my bag. Once the customer had chosen what they wanted, a wooden spoon, maybe, a chopping board, four candles, that's actually what these are, then Esther would wrap them all up, but she wasn't allowed to tot up the money. That had to be done by a man. Leanne, can you demonstrate how this procedure works? Certainly. Five pennies. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. So I would then put this in here. This half a ball. This will be closed tight. Now I would put this in the, the slot, send it up through the system. To the cash office. That would go to the cash office. The gentleman would record in the ledger what you'd spent and he would send you change back the exact same way. A nice, sensible man who would know how to add up. Of course. Not like the giddy girls who wouldn't be trusted with that. <laughs> While adding up wasn't high on her list of duties, Esther was expected to be smart, polite, and have the constitution of a... <laughs> exactly. Anyone who's ever worked in retail knows what it's like standing on your feet all day. But Esther's day started at six in the morning, finished 10 or 11 at night, so a 90-hour week in big, clumpy shoes, heavy skirt, stiff back, smiling nicely all the time. Must have been so exhausting. And, of course, her customers mm. paid her wages, so they were always, always right. At lunchtime, Esther didn't get much of a break, but Michael Marks was better than most employers. At least he installed gas rings like these in the back office so the girls could get some hot food. Such as that shop girl's favourite, a nice bowl of green pea soup. Lovely. For her efforts, Esther was paid a modest £25 a year, around half of what a male shop assistant earned but just enough for the odd trip to the music hall on her one day off. Working in the shop is so commonplace nowadays that it's easy to underestimate quite how different it would have been for someone like Esther. In those days, a lot of people thought that shop girls were a bit tainted, like prostitutes, you know, just standing out there in public selling stuff to customers. Happily, though, for Esther, things were beginning to look up. Because as shopping got more and more popular, shops began to move into fancy arcades like this. And as for the women who were working in them, they started to have a career path. They could end up as shop managers. And who was one of the first women to do just that? Esther Brown. Before the Victorian age, travel was a bit of a bore. The fastest thing around had four legs and eight straw. 
So no wonder the invention of the steam train got everyone, including Queen Victoria, rather excited. Albert, I want one. But trains weren't just for the rich and famous. They were used by almost everyone. Like this ordinary shoemaker's son from Manchester, who describes one memorable train journey in his diary. It is very strange reading the diary of someone who was born over 200 years ago and is so candid about their life. His name was Edwin Waugh. He was a secretary writing letters in his office in Manchester in the late 1840s. He'd just turned 30. He lived in Hume with his wife, who looked after the house when he was away working, which is what a Victorian wife would have done in those days. Everything seems hunky-dory, but the diary tells a very different story. Because Edwin was utterly miserable. He and his wife, Mary Ann, weren't exactly love's young dream. Went to Rochdale in the evening in company with my wife. Oh, full of unhappy reflections. <sighs> and then there was work. Edwin loathed his job and he hated being two-faced, trying to squeeze money out of people who were in debt to his company. He wrote in his diary, I don't have the beggarly eloquence which can humbug them into a false generosity. For his efforts, Edwin earned about a pound a week, around 130 quid in today's money. But often he wasn't paid at all, prompting him to complain, my wife and me had just one halfpenny between us and we knew not where the next meal was to come from. For the long-suffering Mrs War, it all got too much. After a particularly heated row with his wife, Mary Ann, Edwin describes her packing her bags and heading off for her aunt Sally's in Rochdale. She even takes the rocking chair with her, so she's clearly not intending to come home. Edwin's response is to turn to drink. But Mary Ann must have had second thoughts, because she eventually returned home, presumably with the rocking chair too. To celebrate their reunion, Edwin splashed out on a pair of railway tickets to that home of holiday fun, Blackpool. Mary Ann was going to be so pleased. On the morning of the Blackpool excursion, Edwin gets up early, tries to wake his wife, but she won't budge. He's not going to let her spoil his day, though. So he gets washed, gets all ready, and leaves the house. Oh, Mary Ann. When he got to the station, Edwin was gobsmacked by what he saw. I found an astounding gathering of people, upwards of 2,000 persons. You see, to the average Victorian city dweller, the lure of the sea was like human catnip. And beginning in the 1840s, special railway excursions began ferrying hordes of overexcited day trippers to such far flung locations as Brighton, Bangor, and in Edwin's case, Blackpool. Susan, <laughs> how are you doing? <laughs> Thank Good you. Good to see you. We're going off on a yes, holiday. It's very exciting. To tell me more about Edwin's big day out is railway historian Susan Major. Why was he so excited about this excursion? Well, he had a particular thing about the thrill of being in a crowd. Now, to us, being in a crowd is a nuisance. Yeah, but, yeah. But somebody like him, he felt it made it feel as if it was one world. It was a new thing. It was a modern thing. Oh, definitely. In Edwin's diary, he does say that there were 2,000 people. I thought that was a misprint. No, the, these were monster trains with monster excursions quite often. You'd find more than one engine pulling up to 100 carriages. Uh, it, there could be three, four engines. It would have been like being on the London Tube in the rush hour in June, wouldn't it? <laughs> 
People must have felt as though they were being treated as animals. They felt as if they were being dehumanised, so they would bleat and moo and bar. Finally, Edwin's train pulled into Blackpool, where he and his fellow passengers disembarked, and like a crowd of starving penguins, headed straight for the sea. So Edwin comes down the high street from the station, and remember, because the crowd know that they've only got a limited amount of time here, they immediately set to work having a good time. The Blackpool of 1849 didn't yet have its famous tower, or even a pier for that matter. Nonetheless, Edwin was totally smitten. The thing he likes more than anything else, though, is the donkeys. There's little kids who get on them and they won't move. He says everybody is having a good time, except presumably the donkeys. And then towards the end of his stay, he buys four chops, raw chops, off some bloke. And then he goes back into town where someone in a shop fries them up for him for fourpence. What a way to spend the day. As for his problems, well, they now seemed a million miles away. But things weren't just looking up for Edwin. In a momentous time marked by new railways, new sewage systems, and even modern shopping, Go. the Victorian period was a crucial part of British history, driven by ordinary women and men across the land. The Nazis were the most terrifying enemies in one of the nastiest wars in history. But taking them on wasn't just down to men like him. Britain fought the Second World War with a bunch of ordinary office workers, grocers, bakers and housewives. We know the result, but what was it really like for ordinary Britons caught up in it all? Most of the people who still remember the Second World War were only children at the time, but even though they were just kids, a lot of them still have vivid memories of having to seek shelter because their country was under brutal attack. In 1940, eight-year-old Babs Clark and her family found themselves in the thick of it all in London's East End. So what did Babs's mum do? She grabbed the kids and headed for the countryside. Thousands of parents had the same idea. Nearly a million school children were packed off to the country. Babs and her mum and sister Jean ended up in Torquay. It was amazing. They had a small cottage on a farm and went to a local school. Best of all, they could play on the beach every day, safe from the bombs. Or so they thought. Babs, now in her 80s, still remembers one particular incident like it was yesterday. There was a couple of planes coming in from the sea. And I was saying to my sister, I wonder what they are, Jean. And it was two Messerschmitts. And they machine gunned the beach we were on. Cos we came home full of it, telling my mum, and I won't say the actual words my mum said, but in other words, it was so-and-so that for a game of soldiers, we're going back to London, I'd rather have the bombs coming down than the bloody Germans machine gunning my kids. <laughs> Babs and her mum and sister hot-footed it back to the family home in Bethnal Green. Which was yours? This one. So um, when you got back to London, what was your house like? It was all right, apart from the fact we had to have a tarpaulin over the roof. Because the roof had got blown off during the blitz. And you still live there? 
Oh, yeah. Yeah, of course you did. The family's unscheduled break in Torquay may well have saved their lives. And after Hitler had had his way with the East End, it was even more fun than the beach. If, well, a little dangerous. More of a problem for growing kids was food. The government was keen to make sure nothing got wasted. To make sure Britain didn't run out, the amount of food everybody could eat was rationed. And every time you wanted to buy something, you got a stamp in this, your ration book. For Bab's mum, it was a right old drag. Stuff this for a game of soldiers. And provided for only a limited menu. This is what Babs would have been allowed in her rations. A couple of pints of milk, some sugar, a little bit of cheese, some jam, some marge, some lard, one egg and some egg powder, this much meat and a few sweets. It would make a lovely meal, wouldn't it? But it had to last Babs a whole week. The government was full of useful advice on how to make everything go further. But there was one thing that wasn't in short supply for Babs and her family, greens. We hate spinach. We had our allotment and we grew a lot of veg and our allotment was in there. My dad used to be quite proud of that allotment, what things he grew. <laughs> yeah. What did your mum make you? Stew. We used to have a lot of stews. After tea, as night fell, Babs and her mum and sister would head down to the newly built Bethnal Green tube station. EastEnders depended on the underground as the best place to hide from Hitler's bombs. My mum got a bunk down here for a us. A bunk? Yeah, it was a three-tier bunk, bottom, middle and top. There was loads of space because the rails hadn't yet been laid in the new station. But it's surprising the bunks didn't collapse. They'd been assembled by Boy Scouts from a flat pack. How far down that tunnel did you used to sleep? I wouldn't like to say how many yards, but it was a good 10, 15 minute walk. It was quite a way down. And you didn't feel claustrophobic? No, no. I mean, you had the bunks either side and the walkway in the middle, and I think it's because we knew so many people. My mum had stopped and talked to them, and you got to your bunk in the end. What did you do if you wanted to pee? Go in the bucket. The bucket? Yeah, they had buckets. Very so far along. Yeah. With the curtain round it. Very smelly. Oh. Apart from the smell, it all sounds rather jolly. It was like an underground town, with a library, doctor's surgery, say ah, oh. and a hall for weddings or parties. Every time a soldier came home, they had a jolly shindig. Did you feel safe here? Yeah. But there again, you see, I had my mum and my sister, so I felt safe cos I was with them. I wonder if you left anything down there. Bit of chewing gum. I <laughs> stuck so. it on one of the walls. Could still be there, couldn't it? I reckon it? it still is there, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but the fun was about to come to a juddering halt as once again the realities of war hit home. On the 3rd of March 1943, an incident took place at Bethnal Green, which in moments became a major tragedy. It was a rainy night, the air raid siren went off at 8.17. People started coming down into the tube as they always did. But at that moment, anti-aircraft guns began to start firing in Victoria Park, just over the road there. 
fact, and more and more people came down. And it was very dark. They only got one light because of the blackout. And there weren't handrails here then like there are now. And all the steps were really slippy. And a woman tripped over with her son, and some old chap fell on top of them. And more and more people kept pressing down until they were right up to the ceiling, crushing each other. Although Bab survived, many didn't. A memorial next to Bethnal Green tube station, erected surprisingly recently in 2017, marks the worst British civilian disaster in World War II. 173 people were crushed to death. What do you remember about that night? I know I got pushed and I fell over something and somebody fell on me. There were so many people down the stairs, they were all falling on top of them. And I just heard my sister saying, oh, don't pull me out yet, I've got my little sister here. And with that, whoever it was pulled the pair of us out. Didn't know what had happened to my mum. And my sister was going round asking if people had seen anything of her mum, which they hadn't. And then an air raid warden said to her, go in that room, she might be in there. Jean went in there and um, it was all dead bodies she had to look at to see if her mum was there. Luckily, Bab's mum had survived. And the next day, life went on as usual. She still got us up the next morning for me to go to school. And the headmaster was in assembly and he said, there's been a bad accident at Bethlehem Green Tube Station. And he said, any of you children that were in it, you can go home for the day. <laughs> well, after the school come home with us, they all marched out. Did you ever use that shelter again, or was it closed down? Oh, no, we used it the following night. Babs and her family just kept calm and carried on. The German bombing campaign deliberately set out to undermine our morale. But talking to Babs, I get a real sense of the conviction and determination that was shared by almost everyone. And I reckon it was that, as much as anything, that got us through. Many, though, faced a different kind of danger. Hundreds of thousands of ordinary young men were learning how to fight and to kill. James Palmer was one of them. James Palmer lived in Hume, Manchester with his dad. He was very larky, very jokey as a lad. Oh, by heck, do you think they're impressed? I should flip him well up, so. Very good. What's next? By 1939, he was working as an office boy in the garage. He spent a lot of time with his girlfriend, Muriel, and he was just about to turn 21. James's birthday was on July the 1st. But it was a slightly glum affair. War was on the horizon, and young men between the ages of 20 and 22 were being recruited by the government to boost army numbers. James must have opened his birthday cards with mixed feelings. Especially as one of the cards wasn't a card at all. It was his call-up notice. Within two weeks, James was being seen off at the station by his girlfriend and his dad. James's parting from his father was emotional for both men. His dad had served in the First War and had seen the horrors of the battlefield firsthand. And when his wife had died, he devoted himself to looking after his son. And now, he was going to have to let him go. He must have been worried sick. He knew all about war. James wrote in his diary on the day he left. Muriel was in tears, clinging to my arm. Dad turned away as she kissed me. A lump in my throat prevented me from saying much. I was on my way to God knows where or what. Where James was actually headed was Warminster to join the 13th Tank Regiment. On his first day, James was presented with loads of stuff. 
I'm meeting Alex Jones, a war veteran and army historian, to find out more. So he would suddenly have been responsible for all this? Absolutely. As soon as they arrived, they'd have been given a kit bag in the QM stores. And of course, if the army gives someone kit and equipment, you know there's going to be inspections coming up. He'd have had to have bulled his boots. He would have had to have pressed his kit. He would have had to have uh, blankoed the webbing as well. So given it this kind of nice green protective layer, which all the soldiers thought was utterly pointless. Don't say a word, absolute silence. So this is what his setup would have been like. He's not real, by the way, just in case you were wondering. He'd have had a cupboard like this with all his stuff in it and his uniforms laid out. And he'd have had a regulation blanket. Everything ship shape, all out there for the world to see. But amidst all this Boise jollity, James met the corporal in charge. Jock, a regular soldier. On the first night, the lights go out, darkness, you're supposed to go to sleep, but some of the recruits keep on talking and Jock tells them to shut up, but they don't. In fact, they're talking even louder. And Jock goes, when I tell you to do something, you do it. And it goes completely silent. And then one of the recruits says, get stuffed. And then all hell breaks loose. Jock grabs him and punches him straight in the face and knocks him out cold. Oh. Welcome to the war, James. But it wasn't only this mouthy private who got a rude shock from army life. James and the new soldiers like him were complete fishes out of water, weren't they? They really were, because they didn't have any prior military training. Maybe the only experience they had were the stories maybe from their fathers. We know James's father was a veteran of the Somme, for example. Yeah. What would his training have been? Well, James, when he first turned up, would have undertaken eight weeks of basic military training. <laughs> It also would have consisted of anti-gas training. Uh, the army was very concerned about the gas threat. Behind you, there is a pretty fearsome looking instrument. Presumably he would have been trained on that. Yes, this is the, the Vickers machine gun, which would have been the standard armament in a lot of British light tanks at the start of the war. James recounts when he first gets his chance to, to shoot on a live range. Yeah. Uh, he's so excited, he just fires off all the rounds at once. He's going blam, 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 forever and ever. Well, no, because all he has, given the cuts uh, to training allowances, yeah. is 20 rounds to practise with. Which, at about 500 rounds a minute, meant that James would be out of ammo in... Ooh, about two seconds. Oh. Perhaps because of his enthusiasm, James was assigned to be a gunner on a tank. Then, in late May 1940, the call finally came. James was going to fight in France. He was given 48 hours leave, and then he was off. He spent his last day in Britain with his girlfriend Muriel and his father, before heading across the channel. When he landed, the German army was only a few miles away and his tank troop soon found itself under attack. As we topped the rise, anti-tank guns hit us from the right flank. Four of our tanks were ablaze before we'd gone 10 yards. We were sitting ducks. It was sheer murder. I saw some men running amongst the trees with their clothes burning like torches. Men were dragging their pals through the mud away from the burning tanks and the smell of burning flesh was catching my throat. James crouched and he could hear the ping of bullets and the clatter of shrapnel, but his tank driver pressed on and on through the hailstorm of fire and eventually he reached the other side of the valley. Their first action had been a disaster, though. Only four of the 25 lads in James's troop were still alive. Soon, his regiment was desperately retracing the path back to the coast as the army retreated via Dunkirk. They were off back to Blighty almost as soon as they'd left. James returned to Manchester and proposed to Muriel. 
She said yes. But now James had a war to win. He'd be in some of its most crucial battles before life would return to anything like normal and he and his new fiance could finally tie the knot. For many ordinary Brits, taking on Hitler's fearsome war machine demanded a brazen response. And women especially suddenly found themselves doing all sorts of things they'd never imagined doing. Women like Eileen Heron. In 1939, Eileen was 23, but she still lived at home because she worked for her family's grocery business in Folkestone, where she served behind the counter and drove the delivery van. Eileen was a bit of a pioneer. When she was only 20, she'd been among the first women to take the newly introduced driving test. Little did she know, though, what use her driving skills would be once the war started. Just three months into it, 43,000 women volunteered for the Auxiliary Territorial Service, or ATS, the Women's Infantry. And Eileen decided to do her bit and join them. The army welcomed her with an armful of jabs, just a scratch, ah! from a needle already blunted by the other recruits. She shared a freezing Nissen hut with around 20 other women, but at least they could help each other take their medicine before settling down on a lumpy mattress. Oh, night-night. I wonder if Eileen regretted her decision as she sat in her freezing cold barracks. There was three feet of snow on the ground, and OK, the recruits were given a bucket of coal a day, but one bucket was hardly going to make any impact at all in a tin building. At the end of the first week, she trudged all the way to the nearest town for a hot bath at the swimming pool and a nice cup of cocoa. But getting used to unsumptuous living conditions was the easy bit. Eileen was in the army now, and there was a whole new world of pain to embrace. For the new recruits, training was intense and relentless. From the shrill sound of the bugle at 6am... The whole day was a long list of drills, physical exercises and skills training. And all for a measly 11 shillings a week two-thirds of what a man of the same rank would have got. But Eileen was special. She was a high-value recruit because she had something the army needed. She could drive a truck. So-called tele-trucks were used as anything from ambulances to carriers of vital military equipment. And I'm having a go on one. The clutch and the accelerator and the braking is great, but... The steering... Oh. oh, it leaves a lot to be desired compared with today's cars. Every time I go around a corner, I, I feel it in my biceps. But these were brilliant vehicles. They were so adaptable, real dog's bodies vehicles. But the downside was that they were very bumpy and uncomfortable. I'm having a great time, but I'm only doing it for one morning. Eileen had to do it month after month. Poor old Eileen. She must have been knackered. In fact, she called it her wretched Tilly. That was a really good drive. It was nice and simple, you know. There's only sort of four or five little things to push and pull on it. But the Viz is not very good at all. It must have been very difficult at night. Absolutely, and especially because of the blackouts, headlights would have been just a glimmer of light coming from that. And obviously, the threat of invasion was at its height, so uh, all of the signposts were being taken down. And so they'd have to rely on map reading and knowing where they were going. Juliet Pattinson is a historian of the ATS. She knows all about everyday life for women like Eileen. Well, they're in barracks, so they're going to be having mass catering, hearty, nutritious meals that could be feeding hundreds of people. They actually got better rations than the ordinary civilian. Um, but uh, So I think she would have been well-fed. And the rest of the time when she wasn't working? 
she worked long hours, but she would always have time off uh, and they would uh, go to the cinema. There would always be dances on a Saturday. Women were very much in demand at local army barracks. So I think they played hard and worked hard. There's lots of nice accounts where women talk about wearing a bit of lipstick, wearing non-regulation underwear, because nobody's going to notice that they're not wearing their khaki uh, pants. Um, so there are opportunities for these women to individualise the muddy, green, grey, dull uniform. There was a slogan that beauty is a duty too. So you have these manufacturers, whether it's of toothpaste or breakfast cereal or shampoo, and it would be very much, you know, the woman in the ATS, like Eileen, who would be applying particular kind of face cream, for example. There was this expectation that women would pay attention to their appearance because actually it would have a knock-on effect on male morale. I bet if I said to you, beauty is a duty too now, <laughs> you'd smack me in the nose. <laughs> I'm not going to answer that question. <laughs> Eileen might not have enjoyed driving her Tilly very much, but she was obviously pretty good at it because soon she was made a driving instructor and was promoted to the rank of Lance Corporal. This meant she now had 25 trainees under her and a lot more responsibility. <laughs> under Eileen, hundreds of women learned to drive and maintain motorbikes, ambulances and trucks, helping the war effort to smash the Nazis but she was about to experience something even more exciting. One day, Eileen was ordered to go to her commandant's office and he told her a secret. Apparently, a new subaltern, which was the equivalent of a second lieutenant, was going to be working alongside her and her friends. But this was no ordinary subaltern. Her name was Princess Elizabeth. Eileen and Princess Elizabeth were soon mending the tilly trucks together. By day, subaltern Elizabeth mucked in with the other girls, but at night, she turned back into a princess and went to sleep in her castle. Eileen wrote at the time that the princess was quite striking, pretty with lovely eyes and a charming smile. But more celebrities were about to appear. One day, King George VI and his wife turn up to have a look at exactly what it is their daughter, Princess Elizabeth, is doing. And it's, a, it's all pomp and circumstance, until suddenly King George leans under the bonnet, starts fiddling away with the engine. Lord knows what he's doing. One wonders what this bit does. Elizabeth's panicking. Everyone else is laughing. Then Elizabeth gets her hands out and goes, look, Dad, they're all oily. Everyone seems to have seen the funny side. Eileen later wrote that the Queen was very interested to see who these gals were consorting with her elder daughter, and the King was absolutely charming. The visit was filmed at length and became a very effective piece of wartime propaganda. For most ordinary people at that time, the King and Queen had become powerful symbols of the kind of country that they were fighting for. So when their daughter, Princess Elizabeth, was seen amongst them, mucking in, getting her hands dirty, it must have sent a really powerful message. When the Nazis finally threw in the towel, victory in Europe was celebrated with a party to end all parties. Eileen and the other women of the ATS let rip outside Buckingham Palace. And even Princess Elizabeth snuck out incognito to gatecrash the party. Four years before those joyful celebrations, it had only been that bit of muddy water we call the English Channel that held the Nazi foe at bay. But some rather unlucky Brits didn't even have that. It's easy to forget that over 60,000 British people lived under Nazi control here in the Channel Islands. From June 1940 all the way through to 1945. The German invaders were excited to have claimed a little piece of Britain. I suppose that for them, compared to fighting, say, on the Russian front, Hello sunshine, hello sky. It was almost a holiday. Hello white clouds floating by. 
but not so for the locals. Just keep walking. There may not have been any fighting, but the very feeling of being British and any connection with Britain was under attack. Can you imagine what life would have been like here during the German occupation? Would have been a lot of happy, smiling faces, I can tell you that. One ordinary Briton, Hubert Lanyon, was the only baker on the small island of Sark, just off Guernsey. He lived there with his wife and four kids, including five-year-old Maisie. Well, I just remembered um, being told, oh, the Germans are coming, the Germans are coming, and then when they arrived, uh, they marched. And they used to sing beautiful songs, and it, it just echoed all around the island. It was, it was really lovely to hear them singing. And, of course, we were a bit apprehensive, but once we got to know them, and the ordinary soldier was quite friendly. But for Hubert, the new regime changed everything overnight. He even had to share his baker's oven with the Germans. They had half the week and he had half the week. And as war went on, it, it, the provisions came from France. The flour was a terrible quality. It was full of bits of wood, stones and rat droppings. To make things worse, the departing British army had taken a lot of the Channel Islands food supplies with it, and there wasn't much left. We could manage to grow vegetables, which was, a, you know, a saving grace. We didn't have meat, we didn't have much meat, just rabbit. But uh, whatever animal was killed had to be shared with the Germans. The Germans had their proportion and there was so much left for the islanders. Yeah. So the local people started to think outside the box and go in search of new culinary experiences. Yummy! The beach was awash with seaweed, which they harvested and boiled up to make jelly. It wasn't too bad if it was flavoured with blackberries or, frankly, anything they could lay their hands on. As time went by, the food shortages got worse and worse. The fishermen were only allowed to go about a mile out to sea because the Germans were frightened that they would run away. Basic commodities like soap began to disappear off the shelves. What little there was was reserved for newborn babies. Moss replaced cotton wool in the hospitals. Some people said they couldn't recognise their friends and colleagues in the street because they'd grown so thin. Even the Germans were hungry. When it came towards the end of the war, they shot cats, they ate cats. The Germans? Yes, uh, we saw them go up the, the lane with our cats strung on their belt. You're kidding! Our cat was on his belt, they, they'd shot it. That must have be, been awful for it, a little girl to terrible, see that. Terrible. Maisie's father, Hubert, decided to make a stand. In June 1942, the Germans had confiscated the radios on the island. And now people couldn't even get the news. So Hubert joined a secret organisation defiantly named Guns. The Guernsey Underground News Service. Because it was also secret, no one knew very much about it. But... This building is now the Prio Library, and it's here that I reckon I'm going to find the evidence I need about what Maisie's dad was doing in the war. Historian Jilly Carr has found some of the news sheets that the resistance group published. Oh, look, that's V for Victory. Guns and V for Victory. These are original copies. Yeah. And as you can see, they're, they're typed out on tomato packing paper, which is really thin. And if you were caught with one of these, you would have been arrested? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely, yes. So what was it that Maisie's dad actually did on this newspaper? He was the distributor of guns in yeah. Sarg. He had a little library at the back of the bakery. And so he would take a newsletter and put it inside a book in the library so people would come along and browse in the library and, you yeah, know. No, no, no. But apparently there were even German soldiers who knew about it but stayed silent because they also wanted to have the real news. But not everyone could be trusted to keep a secret. Some islanders were prepared to trade information for food even at the risk of having their houses daubed with the swastika. One day, acting on a tip-off, the Germans came to the Lanyon's house, searching for Hubert 
and his newsletters. They had fixed bayonets and they went through the toy basket under the bed, wicker toy basket, and it went right through my panda bear's stomach. Oh. That's outrageous. <laughs> <laughs> But it wasn't long before they found her dad. They beat him up and knocked teeth out, and, and he, was, he was unconscious for a while. And then they hauled him off, hands behind his back and holding his hair and pulling. And he went past our door with yeah. all the family standing on the doorstep. And he just looked at us. And I thought, I suppose he thought, well, when will I ever see them again? Can you remember what you were thinking? Well, I just thought they were being cruel to my daddy. Was your mum able to explain to you what was going on? She didn't know where he was for a month. We, were, we thought he'd been taken to concentration camp and perhaps shot. Then the family discovered Hubert was alive and in prison on the island. Maisie's mum pleaded for his release, saying that the islanders were desperate for him to bake bread. After four months in prison, he was released. But five others involved in the Free Paper were deported to Germany, where two of them died in prison. I consider my father was lucky to come home to us. Sure. And, and I do still feel very sorry for the people whose lives were lost. Of course, there's no doubt that Hubert was a very brave man, but it does make me wonder what I would have done in a similar situation. Would I have resisted, knowing that it could put my family and my neighbours in jeopardy, or would I just have gone about my business and kept my head down till the end of the war? I really don't know. In the Second World War, victory against the Nazis depended on an event that happened far away on the other side of the world, on the peaceful Pacific islands of Hawaii. In December 1941, the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor and forced the United States into the war. The cavalry had arrived, and very quickly, our little island was swarming with Americans. One and a half million of them were either stationed here or stopped off here on their way to Germany. This development had a decisive impact on the course of the war and meant a heck of a lot to the Brits who worked with them, fought with them, or, as was often the case, fell in love with the American GIs. Joy Beaver would be one of them. But back in 1941, before the GIs arrived, she was just 16 and a love affair was the last thing on her mind. Joy soon became her family's only wage earner and had to support her mother and two younger brothers. She catched the train before half seven each day when it was cheaper. But instead of leaves or snow on the line, there was the threat of blown up bridges or unexploded shells. She had a boring job at the inland revenue in the city, typing letters to people who hadn't paid their tax. Joy lived for her daily break. Best time of day was the lunch hour, and I could walk in the gardens of the Tower of London. At the end of each day, she'd catch the train home before night fell and the bombing started once again. Supper could be an omelette made from powdered egg, or if there was nothing else available, there was the sinister threat of whale meat. In the evenings, they'd listen to jazz or popular songs on the record player. Or tune into Winston Churchill for a bit of courage. We will meet out to the Germans more than the measure. They have meted out to us. At weekends, Joy and her friends glammed up and hit the dance hall, the Embassy Ballroom in Bexley, newly reopened after the worst of the Blitz. It's really a nice place. It was a big dance hall and uh, had a nice band. And... It was also a popular haunt for American GIs. And of course, that drew a lot of girls that 
wanted to come there and dance with the soldiers. But these American boys were supposed to be on their best behaviour. Just look at this. This is the little book they all had to read. Instructions for American servicemen in Britain, 1942, issued by the US War Department. The purpose of this guide is to start getting you acquainted with the British, their country and their ways. It goes on to give lots of handy advice. The British are often more reserved in conduct than we. So, if Britons sit in trains or buses without striking up conversation with you, it doesn't mean they're being haughty and unfriendly. Probably they're paying more attention to you than you think. But they don't speak to you because they don't want to appear intrusive or rude. And there's another one here. I really like this. Keep out of arguments. You can rub a Britisher the wrong way by telling him, we came over and won the last one. <laughs> I don't think they'd like that. And most importantly, don't be a show-off. The British Tommy is apt to be specially touchy about the difference between his wages and yours. Keep this in mind. Actually, the British Tommy was most likely to be worried about the thought of a GI running off with his wife or the girl next door. And to be quite honest, he was probably right to be. As one British comedian famously put it, the Yanks were oversexed, overpaid and over here. But the GI that Joy met in September 1944 wasn't like that at all. How did you first meet Carl? He was brought to the embassy ballroom by the other guys in the unit. They said, you, you should come and meet this girl. His name was Carl Beebe. He was not so laughing and joking and all that kind of thing like the others were. You know, he didn't tell me that the streets of New York were paved with gold. <laughs> Carl was stationed here at the stately home Hall Place, two miles from Joy's house. He worked for US Army intelligence, intercepting encoded messages from Nazi high command. Soon, Carl asked Joy out and they hit it off. They'd go for walks in the park near where she lived. He was always bringing me flowers or something. For Easter, he picked a whole bunch of daffodils. There's a place where flowers grow. After three months of courting, Carl proposed. But arranging a wedding in wartime required, let's say, special skills. How did you get a dress this nice in the middle of the war? You'd have to ask my brother. How he got it through some friends of his or people he knows, I don't know. So you're saying it was off the black market, really, aren't you? I believe that it was the black market, yes. Did you get married in a church? Yes, I did. A very much damaged church. The roof was out and uh, the rain and the snow was coming through. And they'd had little pots on the floor to catch the water and you could hear the water dinging into the pots. The Second World War had brought Joy and Carl together and they eventually made the journey to America together with their young son. The war created huge rifts between countries, which took decades to heal. So it's nice to hear some stories of romance coming out of all that chaos. For Joy at least, and for others like her, the war did have a silver lining. The Second World War was the people's war. And for many Britons, its triumphant end remains one of our country's finest hours. 